tonight. We have a full house. There's a lot of interest in this issue, and I appreciate everybody's time. Um, everybody's got busy schedules and a lot, a lot to do, so I appreciate everybody's time on this. Uh, what we're going to do in this pre presentation is do an overview of the DNR review process and this application. Um, we'll include some basics about what's in the application. It's important to make clear that Christine's applied for a diversion, but the DNR has not made a decision on the application yet. The purpose of tonight's meeting is for the public to comment on the application and whether or not it meets the criteria that are in the Great Lakes Compact. So what's the Great Lakes Compact? I'm sure many of you are well versed in this issue, but I think it's helpful when we get into talking about what the criteria and how DNR makes the decision to just provide a little background. So Wisconsin's authority to regulate the diversions of Great Lakes water comes from its participation in the Great Lakes Compact. Wisconsin adopted the compact and its implementing legislation in 2008, and the compact's an agreement between the Great Lakes states and provinces to collectively manage water quantity in the Great Lakes Basin. So it implements parallel water management programs in the Great Lakes states and provinces. It promotes water conservation and efficiency, prohibits diversions with some limited exceptions, and it, and it recognizes that the waters in the Great Lakes can also serve multiple purposes. Uh, a point of clarification here is that the compact allows for straddling communities such as Mount Pleasant to divert Great Lakes water if they meet the prescribed requirements. Uh, here's a table just showing what the requirements are that this application needs to meet. Um, so the DNR as a regulatory agency has to focus on what the criteria are that are laid out in the state statutes and the compact to see if the diversion should be approved or not. Uh, it allows for straddling communities that meet all of these requirements to divert Great Lakes water. Uh, we've had some comments, we've received quite a few comments so far. Um, and we've had some comments that indicate some confusion over that, but they are allowed to uh, have diversions in limited situations if they meet all of those requirements. So you can see this table summarizes what the requirements are and which ones apply to a student's application. But I want to draw your attention, the yes column here does not mean that DNR's determined that the application has met the requirement yet. It just simply identifies that that's one that will need to be met in order for the application to be approved. So first, the application has to be submitted from a public water supply system. Second, the diversion of Lake Michigan water must be for public water supply purposes. Third, all water that's diverted must be returned to Lake Michigan, less an allowance for consumptive use. Fourth, the water that's returned to Lake Michigan must be treated uh, to applicable water quality standards. We've received a lot of comments about the water quality and concerns over water quality returned, and I'll touch more on that. Uh, topic in a few minutes. Um, so the return also needs to prevent invasive species. Uh, fifth, the water return needs to maximize Lake Michigan water that's returned and minimize out of basin water that's returned. Racine has to submit a water conservation plan that meets the requirements of Wisconsin's water conservation rules. These next three are ones that um, are not required for this application. Uh, so first off, the application does not need to include a water supply service area plan. The water supply service area plan is a Wisconsin only provision, and generally diversions do need to have that as part of it. But in this case, the application doesn't need to meet the requirement because the diversion area includes an electronics and information technology manufacturing zone. So this is the zone that was designated in Act 58. And the designated area that's also in the diversion area was defined between the um, contract between the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation and Foxconn. This is the only change to Wisconsin statutes that affects this diversion application. And the Racine diversion application must be standards in Wisconsin's law in the Great Lakes Compact. So as an aside, just because there's been a lot of confusion and misinformation about environmental regulations for Foxconn, well, this isn't a focus of the topic tonight. I did want to just mention a couple things that all existing state and federal um, air, water quality, solid and hazardous waste standards must be met. None of these standards were changed for Foxconn's permitting requirements. Any impacts on wetlands must be mitigated. Filled wetlands must be replaced with two acres for every acre that's filled. So then this next criteria, um, 
related to the exception standard. So because Racine's water supply um, system, they can supply the diversion with the needed water within their existing system's capacity. And because of that, they don't need to meet the exception standard. The exception standard is a set of additional compact criteria, and those criteria did apply to the Waukesha diversion application. So people who've been following some of these diversion issues in the past, it's an application that, it's a set of criteria that did apply to that application. Um, and, and there was a, a New Berlin application for a diversion that um, was approved in 2009. The exception standard did not apply to that application because it was a similar situation to this one where Milwaukee already had sufficient capacity to meet the demand for it. Um, and so finally, regional review by the other Great Lakes states and provinces is also not required for this application because the proposed consumptive use is less than five million gallons a day. That's the threshold that's defined in the compact. And again, regional review was required for the Waukesha application because of the nature of that application but it was not required for the New Berlin diversion application, which was more similar to this application from the city. So what's the review process? Uh, Racine submitted their application at the end of January. DNR posted that application, set up a public hearing and comment period information on our website, um, through press releases, through direct notices. For anybody who's interested in following this application in the review process, uh, if you go to our website, which is listed on the handouts um, that were all on your chairs, you can sign up for something called Gov Delivery that will notify you when there's any kind of action that's taken on this application. So if you're interested, I'd encourage you to do that. Um, we're having the public hearing tonight. As I mentioned, the comment period is open to the 21st. After the comment period ends, DNR will consider the comments, continue reviewing the application. Um, through the review so far, we've asked for seeing about pleasant customers um, of the Racine Water Utility and additional information about the water uh, volumes that they've withdrawn. If we ask um, for any further additional information, that'll all get posted to our website. That's the place that we keep all that information. So finally, DNR will make a decision as to whether the application meets the Great Lakes Compact criteria or not. And as part of issuing that dis uh, decision, we'll also issue a response to comments. So those will be response to comments that we receive through email, comments that people make tonight. Um, now I just want to get into a little bit of specifics about the application. Um, and some of the intent of this is to address the most sort of common questions or issues that we've seen so far uh, in our comment mailbox. First, to orient you to this map, um, i got to find my pointer here. There we go. Uh, this maroon line is the Great Lakes Basin Divide. So this is the Great Lakes Basin, the Michigan Basin here. And then on the other side is the Mississippi River Basin. You see it curves up into here. This hatched area is the diversion area. So this is the area that's in question tonight um, that wants to see, receive water. Um, it's the southwest corner of Mount Pleasant. Uh, Mount Pleasant, Sturdivant, and Racine, their, their boundaries are all shown on this map. This diversion area is bounded by I-94 and the Racine and Kenosha County line. Um, the diversion area is 2.3 square miles. And the city of Racine is the applicant because they're the public water supply system that would divert Lake Michigan water. So one of the requirements in Wisconsin's implementing legislation says a person may apply for approval of a new diversion only if the person operates a public water supply system that receives or would receive water from the new diversion. And then the village of Mount Pleasant is the straddling community and that's one of those exceptions in the uh, compact that allows um, uh, straddling communities to apply for a diversion. So a straddling community means any city, village, or town that's partly in the Great Lakes Basin. Um, but the village of Mount Pleasant, it's important to note here, doesn't have a public water system. Uh, and so all public water supply that's provided in Mount Pleasant is actually provided as direct customers to the Racine Water Utility. And that's the situation as to why Racine is the applicant, because they're the ones that would be diverting the water. So 
this map provides a little bit of a um, closer view of the area. You can see the same um, crosshatch for the diversion area, the boundaries of the different communities in this area. Uh, Racine's proposal is to divert up to 7 million gallons a day of Lake Michigan water. 5.8 million gallons a day of that water is designated um, for Foxconn. 4.3 million gallons a day of this water would be returned to Lake Michigan via the Racine uh, Wastewater Treatment Plant. Um, and the proposal includes a consumptive use of 2.7 million gallons a day. Uh, most of the, the cooling towers uh, for the Foxconn facility. I want you to note that the compact criteria require that all the diverted water be returned to Lake Michigan, less an allowance for consumptive use. So again, this is a comment we've, uh, we've received many comments about concern over consumptive use, but I do think it's important to note that the compact does allow for some consumptive use of diverted water in its requirements. So finally, we've had many comments so far with concerns about water quality from the wastewater return to Lake Michigan. And I just want to provide some context for uh, wastewater treatment processes and how the regulatory authority works um, for a situation like this. So for industrial water users in the diversion area, um, such as Foxconn, and, and this actually applies to any industrial water users wherever they are, but um, in this situation, the facility would need to meet Racine's pre-treatment standards. So this means that the industrial wastewater um, that's going to go to the Racine wastewater treatment plant needs to meet water quality standards before the treatment plant will accept that water. Um, to do this, what the industrial facilities um, have is they just have on-site treatment plants, and that removes contaminants before the water is sent to the treatment plant uh, uh, for further treatment. So any industrial facilities that want to discharge wastewater to the Racine wastewater treatment plant will have to fill out a pre-treatment application and demonstrate that they'll be able to meet the pre-treatment standards before that uh, wastewater treatment plant will accept their wastewater. Um, all wastewater treatment plants in Wisconsin need to have a permit to operate in the state. So in this case, Racine has a wastewater discharge permit and it needs to be in compliance with its permit. Um, part of that permit includes requirements related to this pre-treatment program they have. Racine's one of 27 communities statewide that have pre-treatment programs that are regulated by the DNR. Most recently, DNR audited the Racine's pre-treatment program in January 2018 as part of its regular schedule of audits, and they found that it met um, the program requirements. I hope this provides some clarity on how the sort of industrial wastewater is treated um, before it's, it's discharged to um, Wisconsin Water Labs. So with that, I just want to reiterate, comments will be accepted till the 21st. We uh, encourage you strongly to focus your comments on the Racine Diversion Applications Compliance with the Great Lakes Compact Stradley Community Diversion Criteria. Um, you know, as Adam mentioned, there's multiple ways to provide comments, and the important thing is, is they all receive equal weight. Um, so you can make comments testifying tonight, but you can leave written comments in the box we have out by the door. Um, you can email us comments, you can send us comments by mail. Uh, the bookmarks have got the information on it, your handouts have information as to the, the website and our email address to send those comments to. Um, just again, if you haven't registered to speak and you want to speak tonight, you should go ahead and, and, and register. So we have some time for questions right now. Um, and if you have questions, please raise your hand, you'll get a comment card. You can write down your, your questions um, on those cards. We've got volunteers that are circulating. They'll distribute those cards. Um, you just go ahead and write them down. We'll get them passed up to the front here. Again, the questions should just be about um, the diversion application or the review process. We're not going to be able to answer more general questions about Foxconn or other issues tonight. Um, and by submitting questions in writing, it just facilitates us to be able to answer um, more questions and then we can move into the public hearing portion of the meeting. Uh, one of the first questions has to deal with uh, the wastewater component of this application. Uh, 
is the wastewater treatment plant prepared to treat the, the new contaminants associated with the Cox County food? Uh, as Shaley pointed out, there's a pre-treatment side of this, uh, and then what after pre-treatment, the water is discharged back to the Racine Wastewater Treatment Plant um, at um, what's been termed domestic strength, and, they, and Racine has to treat their wastewater to meet their um, Wisconsin Pollution Discharge uh, Elimination System permit. Um, they have to meet all state and federal requirements uh, with that with that permit. On the pre-treatment side, I guess I, I would turn it over to start with Amy Garvey. She's our um, wastewater engineer. Um, she wants to follow up with any other component on the wastewater side. Um, let you uh, introduce yourself. And, uh, Hi, so I'm Amy Garvey. I'm a wastewater engineer with the department. I do compliance work. Uh, mostly in the Southern District, um, and so my work would be specifically with the City of Racine and how they manage their individual permit, but then also their pre-treatment side. And just kind of to elaborate a little bit more on what Adam said, um, for pollutants that are found to be in either discharges from industries or in a municipality, we do regulate um, all pollutants that we have codified, so either for water quality standards or for other technology based. Um, it's a little bit difficult on a code and codified side of things to catch every new pollutant that might be coming out. Um, and so there's, I guess, two kind of larger chunks that covers these new and upcoming pollutants. Um, one would be specifically on the pretreatment side of things, and it's called total toxic organics. Um, that the Fox Pen would be required to meet that limit that is set by the city of Racine's local limits. And then also on the municip municipality side of things, they do what is called a whole effluent toxicity test on an annual basis to see if there would be any concerns with their discharge as a whole. And so those two tests capture the kind of pollutants that don't specifically have codified I don't know if Racine, I know Racine has some folks uh, that are more on the expert side on pretreatment. I don't know if there's any other follow up on that. Uh, we, look at, you know, we, we covered it? Okay, great. Thank you. Public or not. 
So this is referring to the uh, criteria that they need to be for public water supply purposes, and that's a determination that needs to be made as part of these application review. Um, what are the possible elements of an allowance for consumptive use? Um, so this would be, you know, this is the, uh, how do you decide if it's a, um, in keeping with an appropriate consumptive use. The application talks about what those uses are for. Uh, you know, people look at consumptive use and there's always the thought, well, if it's really high, that's bad. Um, but sometimes that relates to its efficient use of water. So if you're recycling the water, you're using less water, so then your consumptive use ends up being a higher percentage of the total. That's just kind of how that works. Um, and that would be, you know, in terms of DNR, we look at stuff on sort of a case-by-case -case basis of what's the standard for similar kinds of facilities using similar processes to determine if it's within a, you know, sort of a normal um, sort of coefficient for that, that activity. Um, what does the compact deem allowable consumptive use? We just um, uh, so kind of answered that, but, but it doesn't have any specific criteria or standards. It just, it just says simply that there's an allowance for consumptive use. Um, this one says, what about nanoparticles in the water returned to the lake? Um, I'm not aware of, what, of there being water quality standards related to nanoparticles. Um, I don't know if the Racine treatment plant has any issues or any um, criteria or issues related to nanoparticles. No, I'm looking at the utility manager right here and getting a, a head nod. So I don't have an answer to that question. Um, <coughs> Has Foxconn demonstrated wastewater treatment um, will meet the standards? So Foxconn hasn't submitted um, specific information about what their wastewater will contain. Um, you know, this is similar to the situation in um, Waukesha where they were, um, you know, they've received approval from the regional body. They'll need to go through the permitting processes here, but if there's any new industry that comes in, it needs to go through that whole process. So um, Foxconn will need to go through that whole pretreatment application process, but they have not submitted that information yet to us. Um, this one's what type of contaminants are expected to appear in Foxconn's wastewater. As I just mentioned, we haven't um, received any specific information. I know staff at the DNR are looking at what the standards are for other similar types of um, facilities to understand what kinds of broad categories of contaminants this would relate to. Uh, I assume that the Racine um, wastewater treatment folks are doing some similar kinds of things to understand what they'll be needing to look for um, if there's a pretreatment application. Um, who will pay for the testing after pretreatment? Um, so I'm assuming that relates to the, the fact that uh, Foxconn, any industrial users have to do testing um, of their water on whatever the schedule is that's determined by the receiving wastewater treatment plan. Plan who pays for that, uh, Keith? The, uh, the owner of the plant pays for our sampling costs. Okay, so uh, Keith Haas says that the owner pays for both their sampling costs and for the treatment plant's uh, sampling costs. Um, why was the water pipeline already in the process of being built if the DNR decision has not been made? Um, I don't have an answer to that, that question. Um, they are not allowed to serve water. I, they are not allowed to serve water unless they have a diversion application or they'll be in violation of state statutes. Um, so they're not allowed to serve water even if those facilities are being built. Um, so let me just check this. Sure. Thanks. Uh, the, the question was the, percent, the presenter stated Foxconn would use approximately 5 million gallons per day, while media has reported it used closer to 10 million gallons per day. Um, can you account for this discrepancy? Uh, the application is for 7 million gallons per day. A portion of that that we're seeing is applied for, a portion of that, approximately 5.8 million gallons per day, is would be serving the Foxconn facility. The remainder is for other industry within that diversion area. So again, the, the request is for 7 million gallons per day. Um, in the application, 5.8, I believe, it is what, is what Foxconn is requesting at their next use. Um, 
Yeah, next question is who monitors and, and how often the wastewater is seen from Foxconn to ensure that it's being pretreated uh, as stated in the application. Um, Racine, again, is um, accountable for the, going through the pretreatment regulation side of things. Uh, they, Foxconn would need to submit an application to Racine for pretreatment. Um, and Racine would then um, set up a monitoring and reporting um, requirements with, with Foxconn. Is that correct? Uh, in terms of uh, the only other part in terms of the, the DNR's role, DNR does have oversight as um, specified in administrative code, I believe it's 108. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, related to overs oversight of the technology used uh, for the pre-treatment pre on Foxconn facility. So we would look at the, the specifications of that technology and approve that. So please describe the two requests for clarification you sent to the Racine uh, Water Utility. So um, we had two pieces of information we asked for. Uh, one of them was to get a better understanding of what the customers were in Mount Pleasant. So in their application, they provided the total number of customers for the Racine Water Utility. But we asked them to provide a breakdown of that for um, how many of those customers are in uh, Mount Pleasant so that we can have a better understanding from this public water supply purposes angle of how many of those customers are residential, commercial, and industrial that are currently being served by the Racine Water Utility. The second piece of information we asked for was for some additional information on what the utility's water withdrawals are, so just what historically they've been, how those break out by, um, by customer class as well. Um, this is another one about consumptive use that I already answered. Um, can the existing wastewater treatment plant pl process the large increase in the wastewater? Christine's diversion application um, claims that they have sufficient ca capacity, sites that they have sufficient capacity to um, treat the additional wastewater. Uh, what happens if Foxconn needs more than 5 million gallons a day? So the diversion application is for 7 million gallons a day. So that's the amount of water that Racine would be legally allowed to divert. Um, if at any point in time they determine that they're going to need more than that, they would need to submit a new application and apply for um, additional water, um, you know, assuming that they got that diversion in the first place. Um, what's the cumulative impact of the request to pull water from Lake Michigan given um, the recent request from Waukesha. Uh, so I went over and pulled, over, pulled out my notes. So the question here is about cumulative impacts. Um, the, one of the things about the Great Lakes Compact is one of the requirements in there, all the states have to collect water withdrawal information, consumptive use information, provide that to a central repository. And then they also have to, every five years, do a cumulative impacts assessment. So the, the key for them doing that assessment is to say, hey, let's keep track as we're growing at, you know, if we're using more water, what's the impact of that to the lakes overall on a water balance? Um, and if you look at that information, what it really says right now is that the Great Lakes are dominated by precipitation, inflows, and the water going out is dominated by evaporative losses, and that the, the current consumptive uses and diversions um, are a tiny fraction of what those evaporative losses from the lakes as a whole are. So that's part of how the overall compact is structured to be able to keep that watch on, um, on how the lakes are doing. Um, in terms of some context right now, uh, from our water use reporting, Wisconsin withdraws from both groundwater and surface water sources um, on average about 4.1 billion gallons a day of water from Lake Michigan. So that just gives you some context. The Waukesha diversion application was for 8.2 million gallons a day, and this one um, is, is for seven. So those are, and the water then, um, in the Waukesha situation, you know, it all goes back in this situation, there's a consumptive use associated with that. Uh, who gets the water, Foxconn, or um, people in case of mandatory restrictions due to drought? So um, Wisconsin doesn't have a mandatory policy of how water is allocated in droughts. 
However, in this context, because you're talking about Lake Michigan um, and Wisconsin in general, you don't have drought situations where you're drawing from a river that's going to dry up and not have sufficient application. So the you know the drought issues would come into play if you have like um, you know an agricultural situation where somebody's drawing water out of a fairly small stream. But in this situation, that's not really. Um, a factor that comes into play. And then is the estimated water usage 7 million gallons a day for uh, 3,000 or for 13,000 workers? So here the diversion would, would certainly be used to serve the needs of workers in the facility. However, um, predominantly the water use, when they have that 8.5 um, volume of that water, uh, for the facility, that's processed water. So that's water that's going to the facility to make the um, LCD panels and, the, and the, the product that they're making. And a much smaller portion of that amount is, um, you know, would be used for uh, purposes for the uh, for the workers. So the number of workers isn't the factor in terms of the diversion amount. So, um, do you have any more DNR said that Fox County will only be using five million gallons, but the, the specifics in the specifics you say they'll use approximately 5.8, so it doesn't that require regional review? That's a good question. There's a lot of numbers out there, a lot of criteria to figure out. The uh, Fox County is using, uh, proposing to use 5.8 up to 5.8 million gallons per day, uh, total diversion of seven million gallons per day. The regional review criteria that I think is getting confused here is um, five million gallons per day of consumptive use. So if Fox County was losing five million gallons of water um, through cooling towers, let's say, then that may trigger, trigger through the criteria, um, compact criteria, a regional review where the other jurisdictions as part of the compact would review this. Because the consumptive use is less than five million gallons per day, it does not require a regional review. Uh, <clears throat> does the on-site pretreatment process address heavy metals removal and will we seen um, treatment plan uh, dictate Fox County effluent limits. Fox County will have to pre-treat to ensure that what they are discharging is domestic strength for Racine to be able to treat at their wastewater treatment plant and that's their requirement and they'll set up a pre-treatment program to ensure that. Is that, I want to make sure I'm... No, I'm just asking, what about what's left over? Um, so, I'll follow up with that but just if you could keep your comments to the, the original cards. I understand, please. Um, the treat, the, what's left over, if there is a sludge left over, if there's um, that kind of byproduct left over, that's going to have to be treated through uh, hazardous waste permit, um, and they will have to follow state and federal standards on the removal of that waste as well, that waste stream. So if there's a solid waste stream associated with it, it's, it's a, a good point to make that if there is another product besides, they will have to ensure the proper disposal of that too. Said, all right, well, that we're going to wrap up our Q&A for the public hearing portion of this evening. I do want to let you know there, um, I believe there is an overflow room in the outside, um, the outside of this room and into the left corner, there's an auditorium and um, it's streaming Wisconsin Eye, which is basically what's being televised in this room. Uh, so if you want to speak, but you want a more comfortable place to listen until, until your time is, comes up, there is that option um, for you to, uh, to go through. So I want to offer that up since I see a lot of people standing. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jane Langretti, our good ones. All right. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to tonight's hearing. My name is Jane Langretti, and I'm an attorney with the DNR Bureau of Legal Services, and I've been assigned to conduct tonight's hearing. We do want to thank you for your interest and appreciate you being here. I'm going to read a short formal statement and then get to the important part of tonight's uh, evening, which is hearing from you all. So the purpose of this hearing is to receive comments on the City of Racine's application for a proposed diversion of, lake, of the Great Lakes water for public water supply with return flow to Lake Michigan. The city of Racine requests to divert up to an annual average of 7 million gallons of water a day in the straddling community 
the village of Mount Pleasant. Wisconsin law section 281.346 sub 4b of the Wisconsin statutes requires that an applicant for a diversion be a public water supply system that would divert the water. The city of Racine is the appropriate applicant to apply for a straddling community diversion application on behalf of the village of Mount Pleasant because the Racine water utility is the public water supply system that would divert the water. The straddling community, the village of Mount Pleasant, does not own and operate a public water supply system and is thus not eligible to apply for a straddling community diversion approval. Under the Great Lakes Compact, the village of Mount Pleasant is a straddling community, which means that the village lies partly within the Great Lakes Basin and partly outside of the basin. So I'll ask that everyone please sign in and let us know whether or not you intend to provide oral comment at this hearing. Um, please, again, sign in the halls, uh, even if you do not wish to make a statement uh, so that we do have an accurate record of who attends the hearing. And you can always change your mind later if you decide to or not to speak. Uh, the Department of Natural Resources has set this time and place, 6.30 p.m., March 7th, 2018, at the S.C. Johnson IMETS Center in Sturdivant, Wisconsin, for a public informational hearing on the City of Racine application for the proposed diversion. For the record, an informational presentation was held immediately before this hearing at 6 p.m. in this same location. The public had an opportunity to ask questions of DNR staff following the informational presentation. This hearing is being held pursuant to sections 1.11 and 281.346 sub 9 of the Wisconsin statutes and section 150.30 sub 3 of the Wisconsin Administrative Code. Now this hearing is informational in nature, so it's not a contested case hearing and it's not an adversarial hearing. The purpose of this hearing is to hear comments from members of the public on the Racine Diversion application. The hearing has been noticed on the department's website and in the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel and Racine Journal Times, and all notice requirements of the statute have been followed. So either instead of or in addition to an oral statement at tonight's hearing, again, written comments can be accepted by the department by the close of business on March 21st, 2018. And written comments should be sent to Adam Freihofer via email or hard copy at the address on the hearing notice. Written statements will have the same weight and effect as oral statements presented at the hearing. So, we are here tonight to take your comments on the City of Racine diversion application. DNR will review and summarize all public comments related to the City of Racine diversion application. The department will determine whether or not the diversion application application meets the Great Lakes Compact criteria for a straddling community diversion and will either approve or deny the application. Again, we appreciate all of you who have come to tonight's hearing. Uh, so with me at the table, again, are Adam Freihofer, you heard from earlier, and, and Shaley Pfeiffer from the DNR. Other DNR staff here include Eric Ebersberger, uh, Chris Folksteiner, R.J. Pyre, Jim Dick, Jim Zelmer, I believe, is here, and Amy Garvey. So we are beginning in the hearing at 6.45 p.m. Uh, we would like to hear from as many people as we can. Uh, so we will be limiting oral comments to three minutes per person. And this is just so that we have a chance for everybody to, to get a chance to speak. So remember that if you have lengthy comments, you are more than welcome to submit them to the department in writing. And we have forms in back again for you to use uh, if you would like to turn in written comments uh, tonight at the hearing. And again, we'll be accepting those written comments until March 21st. So with that, I'll give, briefly give some ground rules for the hearing that are important for everyone to know. Um, and, for, and I will mention too that people are still parked on the street and we sure don't want anybody to be ticketed. So. Um, we do recommend that you move your vehicles if you're parked illegally. So, uh, given the number of people here today and the acoustics of this room, 
Uh, we do ask that there be no talking amongst yourselves or side conversations among the audience. Uh, if you wish to talk amongst yourselves, please do uh, go out in the hall in the back. We want everyone in the hearing room to be able to focus their attention on the person who is talking. Uh, second, as I said earlier, I will be limiting three minutes uh, per person. So that means when you come up to the mic to speak, uh, we will let you know when your time is up. So what we're going to do is use signs. Uh, a yellow sign means you have 30 seconds uh, to wrap up, and a red sign means your time is up, and please do stop talking. Uh, so that we can get on to the next person who'd like to offer their comments. So I'll be calling on people to speak, just one at a time, and I'll call out the names of the next person who's going to speak after that so that you can uh, kind of make your way up to the front of the room and, and we can run this as efficiently uh, as, as possible. I think there's, uh, there's a chair here next to this mic uh, that, that you can sit in while you're waiting for your chair or just come up to the side here. So again, um, when it is your turn to offer a comment, please do state your name and address for the record and speak into the microphone. So the purpose for us of today's hearing is to listen to your comments, and we really do appreciate your time and courtesy. So first I'd like to call on Keith Ross, and after that will be Corey Mason. Thank you. Oh, excuse me. Um, as, as you said, my name is Keith Haas. I'm the general manager of the Racine Water Utility and Wastewater Utility. I have the privilege of providing this community with safe drinking water every day of the year. And I also have the responsibility to provide this community with um, clean wastewater water. A little bit of history tonight. We have been treating wastewater in this community for 80 years. For those of you that are longtime city residents, you know that Racine was founded in 1848. That means for the first 90 years of its incorporation, we had no wastewater treatment. All industrial discharge through the Industrial Revolution and the early part of this previous century went untreated into the river, into Lake Michigan. It was not a good sign. So for 90 years, we went untreated. For the last 80, it has gone to a wastewater treatment plant. During that time, we had combined sewers so sanitary and storm sewers uh, were combined. That meant on rainy days, sanitary sewage went into the lakes and the streams. In the 70s and 80s, we're seeing separated their sewers so that only sanitary sewage went to the treatment plant. That was a big deal. In 1983, the federal government um, promulgated the pretreatment rule. And at that time, industries then had to pretreat their waste. That was 35 years ago. So for about 140 years, no industrial waste was treated before it was discharged to Lake Michigan, except for what might have been treated at the wastewater plant in the first 40 years. We currently have 40 industries that are permitted to discharge industrial waste in our community. One of those large industrial complexes is sampled every day of the year, Saturdays, Sundays, Christmas, Thanksgiving. So we are not foreign to sampling someone every day of the year as Foxconn will likely fall into that category. As was said earlier, the DNR inspects our pretreatment program on a biannual basis. We did so in January. At Racine Wastewater, we measure our staff competence in decades. I'm just a second decade, working on my second decade, but my pretreatment staff, three of them who are here tonight, have eight decades of experience in pretreatment. They will be the staff that will be reviewing Foxconn's permit. We will also be reviewing it with DNR staff. I get to review the final results twice a year on a biannual report that goes to DNR, and I get to sign the permits and the applications, certificates that go to those industries. Whoever opens a business in this community, small or large, has to comply with local, state, and federal pretreatment rules. This is true in every community bordering the Great Lakes. Mount Pleasant is no different. So please rest assured, Foxconn will likely beat the standards imposed and permitted. We had the privilege to meet with Foxconn engineers and some pretreatment engineers last year, and I have no doubts that they will meet or beat any pretreatment limits in the country. Um, they will be subject to local ordinances, state statutes, national pretreatment standards, and categorical pretreatment. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Corey Mason is next, and then after that, we'll call on David DeGroote. 
Well, good evening, and thank you everyone for coming out here tonight. My name is Corey Mason, I'm the mayor of Racine, uh, previously a state legislator who worked on the passage of the Great Lakes Compact Bill. Um, so there will be a discussion tonight on the merits of this proposal that the city of Racine has put forward, uh, and public comment is an important part of that process, and I'm glad everybody's here and would encourage that. Uh, prior to my taking office, the water utility elected to submit this application to the DNR for its review. And in, in that time, since the application, the comments and questions I've received the most are actually more about what's not in the application than what is actually in the application, particularly as it relates to discharge. So to be clear, and this is reiterative, I really realize, but to be clear, there is nothing in the diversion application that would exempt Foxconn or any other user from discharge laws at the water utility, or the wastewater utility, it's very important. Uh, and, and so they will have to meet all the standards that exist under the law. I wanna make a statement that really I think is important for the community to hear, that not on my watch are we gonna let an application go through for a permit that wouldn't meet or beat every local, state, or federal standard. As mayor was seen, and a wastewater commission and I'll make sure that that's the case. I also can pledge to everyone here tonight to be open and transparent throughout that permitting process. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next we'll call on uh, David DeGroote, and after that, Rob Richardson. Good evening. I'm David DeGroote. I live in the village of Mount Pleasant, and I served as the village president. So as president of the village, I'm a little closer to the action than most people are, and I think I can speak on this subject with a certain degree of authority. Earlier this year, the city of Racine submitted a straddling community water diversion application for the Great, Lake, for Great Lakes water to the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, the DNR, on behalf of the village of Mount Pleasant. The application is being paid for by Mount Pleasant and the application, or the application was board approved with a six to nothing vote. The application is to extend water service to the portion of Mount Pleasant that is located in the Mississippi River Basin, including the future site of the manufacturing facility being constructed by Foxconn. Apart from, the, from an imperceptible rise that created within the area. The application is to divert an average of 7 million gallons per day. It's important to note, and let me emphasize, it's important to note that this is a straddling community diversion request. It's not a request for approval to withdraw more water from Lake Michigan. If approved, the diversion will have little, if any, impact on Lake Michigan water volume or quality. What's being drawn out will be returned less consumptive use, nothing more, nothing less. The Racine Water Utility already has the approved withdrawal capacity and the existing treatment infrastructure to support it. All water returned to Lake Michigan from the diversion area will be treated by the Racine Wastewater Utility, which has the capacity to handle the anticipated flow. The Racine Water and Wastewater Utilities have excellent track records of managing water and wastewater, including requiring whatever site-based pretreatment of water is necessary. They know what they're doing. So I encourage the DNR to approve this application as it meets all, may I repeat, it meets all the criteria for a straddling community diversion application as identified in the compact, as well as Wisconsin implementing legislation. Thank you for letting me share my thoughts with you and we look forward to your decision. Thank you. Thank you. So next we'll call on Rob Richardson, and after that, uh, Gordon Johnson. Gordon would like to waive his opportunity. Okay, thank you. So then uh, next it'll be uh, Margie uh, Paleon. I'm sorry that I must have mispronounced that. Go ahead. Well, all right, my name is Rob Richardson. I'm the chair of the Mall Pleasant Community Development Authority and a resident of Mount Pleasant for over 35 years. 
I believe Lake Michigan is one of our greatest natural resources. I also believe when used responsibly and with care, it is our community's greatest asset. Lake Michigan is a key reason why many businesses choose to operate here. It's also why individuals and families choose to live here. The diversion request being considered by the Village of Mount Pleasant, uh, the city on behalf of the Village of Mount Pleasant, uh, is something that Mount Pleasant has been considering for years. Mount Pleasant has explored ways to support the broader development of the 994 corridor, creating even more jobs and residents for Racine County. We have been presented with a great opportunity to expand development in Mount Pleasant along the I-94 corridor. The time is right for considering how we can provide clean, reliable, safe water to the businesses that will locate in the area, along with the thousands of workers they will employ. We have a great partner in the Racine Water and Wastewater Utility. The utility has the capacity and the resources to make the diverted water available and to effectively treat the resulting wastewater. On behalf of the Village of Mount Pleasant Community Development Authority, I urge Wisconsin DNR to approve the diversion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, after our next speaker, we'll have Louise Petering. The Lake Michigan Region uh, League of Women Voters. The League of Women Voters Lake Michigan Region is an interleague organization made up of 63 local leagues of the women's voters within the Lake Michigan watershed and regional planning areas along with the four state leagues. We advocate that you refuse the proposal by the city of Racine to divert an average of 7 million gallons of water from Lake Michigan daily to meet five box cons of private foreign industrial companies water. Water needs. The Great Lakes Compact states, quote, all the water so transferred should be used solely for the public water supply purposes within the straddling community, unquote. The League of Women Voters Lake Michigan Region supports the Great Lakes Compact, an eight state and two Canadian leadership pact that states and sets rules for the withdrawal and return of water from the, lake, from the lakes. We support preserving and enhancing the environmental integrity and quality of the Great Lakes St. Lawrence River ecosystem. We urge you to examine carefully whether Foxconn has met the requirements of the Great Lakes Compact. Clearly, we are concerned that the Foxconn diversion application is for industrial use and has not adequately provided enough detail about the amount and the quality of the water that will be returned to the city of Racine and Lake Michigan. Fox Camp Con has not implemented sufficient conservation practices in its other industrial locations. Wisconsin has bypassed requirements of environmental impact statements and has dismissed wetland precautions in an area of recent costly flooding in the Racine County. Keep in mind that Fox Con proposal is the first of its kind you are considering. What happens to this proposal was set a precedence for countless future requests. Am I done? No, you got Requests from municipalities in Wisconsin, as well as all eight Great Lakes states and two Canadian provinces that border the lakes. We believe water conservation and water pollution prevention should be a high priority of all governments in the basin. We urge you not to approve the current proposal for a private industrial company's use of Lake Michigan water. Due to the non-public use, the 30 to 40% loss of water to be discharged, and the absence of a complete and detailed plan to remove the toxic chemicals in the water discharge from Fox Con. So I'm sorry to the, you. To the city of <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. 
Many cities and communities around the country and even the world would love to have our water. And many people are experiencing shortages. Uh, we recently attended the Waukesha hearings about their diversion. Now Waukesha is a city. It's hard to move a city. Foxconn doesn't exist. It's not a city. There's land that's within the basin where they could locate without a diversion. I'm sure the communities here will insist on the best pretreatment for this company if they're permitted, as well as they would for any company within the basin. The point is that allowing a diversion for this private company threatens the whole Great Lakes system and uh, should not be permitted just for that reason. Also, it is not just a straddling area. On the other hand, this company's property is located at the headwaters of the Des Plaines River, which runs into the Illinois River, which runs into the Mississippi River. They uh, would not, I presume, be prohibited from drilling wells and using the Des Plaines River for disposal. And I don't know how those disposals would be handled by Kenosha or Illinois. So that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. After Jody, we will have Melissa Soli. Good evening. I'm Jody Habish Sinekin with Midwest Environmental Advocates. As an environmental attorney who has championed, watchdogged, and studied the Great Lakes Compact for going on 14 years, I feel a sense of responsibility to comment on the present diversion proposal and the harmful precedent it may set for the Great Lakes Compact. The Great Lakes Compact is nothing to take lightly, as its enactment was a historic accomplishment and celebrated as a means to safeguard the freshwater resources of our magnificent Great Lakes. A centerpiece of the compact then and now is its ban on diversions, reflecting the region's determination to prohibit the transfer of Great Lakes water outside the basin unless a diversion request can meet the narrowly defined exceptions outlined in the provisions and definitions of the compact. It is here where the City of Racine's present request for diversion falls short. Section 4.9.1 of the compact plainly states that in order for a straddling community exception to apply, all the water so transferred shall be used solely for public water supply purposes within the straddling community. Yet on its face, Racine's application does not and cannot satisfy this core threshold requirement. Why? because the 7 million gallons of day per day of, of water doesn't meet the compact's definition of a public water supply purposes. Specifically, the compact defines public water supply purposes as, quote, water distributed to the public, serving a group of largely residential customers that may also serve industrial, commercial, and other industri institutional operators. Here is the rub. Because a group of largely residential customers will not be the ones served by the 7 million gallons per day sought by the city of Racine. Rather, the complete opposite is true. Racine will use the majority, if not the entirety, of the diverted Great Lakes water to serve the industrial needs of a single, private, foreign, industrial entity, Foxconn. Racine's application thus represents a test of our state's and region's commitment to the Great Lakes Compact, whose integrity is on the line. Which is why Wisconsin should not be in a rush to approve Racine's diversion for Foxconn. Fudging compact criteria, allowing a key definition's plain meaning to slide, sets a harmful precedent at a time when the compact is still new and being tested, and at a time when global trends dictate that our region undertake a conscientious stewardship of our freshwater supplies. To ensure a Great Lakes compact that is strong and sustainable, we need to honor its language and intent at every opportunity. That opportunity is here and now. Thank you. Thank you. After Melissa Soling, we'll have James 
Penjikowski. Thank you for the opportunity to provide comments this evening. My name is Melissa Soline. I'm a program manager uh, with the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Cities Initiative. We're a coalition of more than 130 U.S. and Canadian mayors representing more than 17 million people in the region, uh, working to advance the protection and restoration of the Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence River. The Cities Initiative supports economic growth within the basin with the understanding that it cannot be achieved by compromising the protection of natural resources and the environment. We are concerned about withdrawals and return flows associated with the Racine Diversion application related in part to the Foxconn Technology Group project in Mount Pleasant, Wisconsin. We have specific concerns regarding upholding the integrity of the Great Lakes Compact, maintaining water quality, and ensuring environmental compliance. With respect to the Racine Diversion application, the City's initiative strongly urges that the legal requirements of the Great Lakes Compact be met in order to safeguard the sustainability of Great Lakes and St. Lawrence water resources. All wastewater discharged to the Racine Wastewater Utility must meet or be pre-treated to meet applicable water quality standards, including federal and state categorical pre-treatment standards and local limits established by the City of Racine. The city's initiative strongly urges the state of Wisconsin and the appropriate federal agencies to ensure compliance with environmental laws and regulations related to air, water, and waste. Transparency and accountability are of utmost importance when it comes to water diversions and water use in the basin to ensure our water resources are available for future generations. The Great Lakes and St. Lawrence River support significant ecosystems, a $5.8 trillion regional economy, and provide drinking water to more than 40 million people. Economic development and environmental sustainability must go hand in hand in order to ensure the health and vitality of the people of this region, our communities, and our economies. Thank you again. Thank you. After James Penchikowski, we'll have Kesha or Keisha Patel. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is James Pensakowski, current address 21818 Lakeland Avenue, Madison. I am a fourth generation citizen of the USA and the great state of Wisconsin. I was born in Racine, Wisconsin and raised just a few miles from here on Wood Road in the town of Summit. I spent the first 31 years of my life within the watershed of Lake Michigan. My father and his father fished in this great lake Somewhere in the family archives is a photo of my grandfather proudly showing off a sturgeon he caught from this lake. My father loved fishing for perch. This great lake contains the melted remains of the last ice age. We do not have a means of replacing what we take from or despoil in this great lake. Natural processes that predate all of us and nature's God have gifted us with a resource that we squander at our risk and the risk of our children's, 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 children, the proverbial seven generations. If this is a true hearing and not a token gesture to appease the letter of the law, then please consider the following. Determine what industrial processes this treasured water resource will be put to and if heavy metals or other toxic substances would leach into the wastewater, then deny the use of Great Lakes water. Number two, all industrial processes used in the manufacture of products in this area should come in for a fine-toothed home inspection, open to the public before any permits are granted, and there should be no excuse of proprietary processes to hide behind. Number three, if you can re reliably confirm that wastewater from these industrial processes will not be contaminated with heavy metals or other toxic substances, then meter the wastewater going back into the municipal wastewater treatment facility to ensure that every last drop not lost to normal evaporation is recaptured so that Great Lake water levels are not adversely Number four, require that all these new industrial users of this great lake water resource pay the retail cost of the water use. That is the same rate that every residential single family homeowner and the municipal water system pays. This may be the only direct benefit 
that many of them may ever see from this industrial expansion into some of the finest arable land in the world. Thank you for listening, and may wisdom accompany you and your deliberations. Thank you so much. Uh, after our next speaker, we'll call on Pete Mackin. My name is Keisha Patel. I'm from Waukesha, Wisconsin, and I was a recent graduate of the University of Wisconsin, Waukesha. Upon reading the water diversion application, I found that Foxconn has not provided any of the necessary information about the manufacturing processes, which could potentially have an ill effect on the water diverted from the Great Lakes. And after doing some further research into LCD manufacturing in Foxconn, I also found that the LCD manufacturing industry is one of the dirtiest industries in the world today. The chemicals used in LCD manufacturing include benzene, a solid cleaner, and a known carcinogen suspected to have caused leukemia in a lot of factory workers um, in Fox factories in China. And hexane, uh, used to clean glass panels, also known to degrade functions of the central nervous system. Heavy metals such as cadmium, chromium, zinc, and copper used in the power supply, which are bioaccumulative and poisonous in large amounts. Nitrogen trifluoride, which is a potent greenhouse gas and is used to generate fluorine, um, which is used to clean surfaces. Now, uh, because of requirements by Apple and Nokia, benzene and, and, and hexane are starting to get phased out. However, no other companies have made such, other, such requirements. Thus, we have no clear picture of which of its customers Foxconn will be um, serving fruit factory and scene, and there's no way to know whether they will be using benzene and hexane or any of the other chemicals. We don't know what kind of toxic chemicals might be going out with the wastewater and whether they can even be cleaned out sufficiently. Previously, the Institute of Public and Environmental Affairs, led by China's leading environmentalist Ma Zhang, uh, had accused Foxconn of polluting the land and rivers near their factories in China. People living near the factory, uh, in, near the factory city in Taiwan, Taiwan City, China, testified saying that there was an unbearable stench and they suffered of coughs, headaches, and stomach problems. Is there a guarantee that the same won't, ha won't happen here? Um, because according to Wisconsin Act 58, they are not required to obtain any permits in order to, in order to discharge dredge materials into streams, fill, fill wetlands, or even change the course of streams. Foxconn hasn't revealed any of their manufacturing processes or the materials that they will be using during the, their, uh, the process that they use to create uh, LCD screens. And as part of the Great Lakes community, we should all be questioning why. I request that the, Racine, uh, that the city of Racine be denied permission to divert additional water until Foxconn reveals any and all information about its customers, its manufacturing processes, and is transparent about the impact that the water diverted from the Great Lakes would have. Thank you very much. We'll, we'll call on Pete Mackin, and then after that, Lucas Weber. Hey, thanks for this opportunity. My name is Pete Mackin. I'm the manager of Evergreen Technology Research and Development Labs in uh, Upper Michigan. Uh, we're partnered with a sponsored research agreement with Michigan Tech University. And we also are partnered with Putian Bao Group, an environmental protection company based in Xi'an and Suzhou, uh, China. Uh, what the previous speaker said is actually true. And in recently, the last five-year plan that China put out, they put very strict, in fact, more strict than Great Lakes water quality standards across the industry in China. And people have been scrambling to meet those standards. Our, uh, our CEO with Fu Tianbao saw this coming. Uh, we treat, our company treats wastewater, industrial wastewater, first at industrial park and we expanded to uh, work with electric lighting companies in Shanghai and Suzhou. And so as of now, our, uh, the technology that we developed both here in the United States with engineers from here and in China, uh, we are, as far as I know, the only company that's able to guarantee 100% uh, 100% uh, uh, zero discharge. And so we recycle, we first we, uh, we uh, um, uh, treat and, and condense the materials, and then we essentially recycle the heavy metals. The metals that you don't want into the Great Lakes are also expensive materials for companies. So you're know, talking palladium, platinum, chromium, these are things we do not want to buy, kill them, as we say, but they're also very costly to companies to acquire, so putting them in a sludge or landfill is not very economic. And so one thing we found across the Great Lakes and the Upper Peninsula in particular, when we've uh, 
had to deal with legacy costs from environmental remediation for our past mining practices, we found that by making environmental protection, radiation, mitigation uh, economically beneficial, in, in, in addition to um, uh, just environmentally beneficial, speeds up the process of, of encouraging companies to do what's both environmentally and economically right. So uh, as, while we have not yet spoken with Foxconn, we're encouraged uh, about their commitment to uh, basically make sure they meet the highest standards here. We look forward to talking with uh, Racine and with uh, the Mission for Spencer PNR uh, about their progress. And uh, we definitely like to take a look at the project that it comes in and make sure that we can uh, help you make your needed exceed your pre achievement standards. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, after Lucas Weber, we'll call on Eric Hansen. Good evening. My name is Lucas Weber. I'm the General Counsel and Director of Environmental and Energy Policy at Wisconsin Manufacturers and Commerce, or WMC. WMC is Wisconsin State Chamber of Commerce Manufacturers Association. Uh, we've got about 3,800 member businesses of all sizes across all sectors of Wisconsin's economy, making us the largest business trade association in the state. I am here representing WMC to testify in support of the Receipt Water Diversion application tonight. The application before you is uh, to allow exactly what was intended when the compact was first adopted. We ask you to affirm the goals of the compact and strengthen it for future generations by approving the application now before the department. The compact establishes a clear legal framework within which the application is to be considered. Specifically, this application proposes a diversion to a straddling community under Wisconsin Statutes 281.3464C. As the application makes very clear, every statutory requirement for approval is met. The water, uh, contrary to what was said earlier, the water will be metered and sold to customers by the water utility clearly within the public use parameters set forth by statute. The approval of this application is vital. It's a vital step toward a massive economic development project in our state. The, pro the proposed project will create thousands of high-skilled, family-supporting, long-term jobs right here in Wisconsin. It will spread the benefits via the establishment and growth of a booming supply chain throughout Wisconsin. All that growth and all the benefits that come from it hinge on the availability of the water resources proposed in this application. It is important that we recognize the compact is working to protect our great water resources. All of the Great Lakes are above average water levels and are forecast to continue rising. Lake Michigan is a massive freshwater resource containing more than 1,100 cubic miles of water. That's more than 1.2 quadrillion gallons. Uh, the proposed use is around 2 billion of 1% of the total water volume in the land. To put the volume of Lake Michigan into perspective, it's enough to cover the entire state of Wisconsin in about 95 feet of water. I would also note that during peak evaporation season, uh, between 55 and 110 billion gallons of water are lost per day from Lake Michigan via evaporation. Using the low end of that estimate, the total 7 million gallons of water proposed to be diverted in this application is the same as about 11 seconds of uh, Lake Michigan evaporation. The actual water proposed to be consumed is even less, about four and a half seconds of total evaporation from Lake Michigan. In the time I spent testifying, about 114 million gallons of water evaporated from Lake Michigan. It is also important to emphasize that beyond the compact, the proposed project will be heavily regulated and very importantly, will need to follow the same stringent air quality and water quality permitting and regulations as every other Wisconsin I would. The compact regulates our utilization of the Great Lakes freshwater resources. The application before you meets all of the requirements laid out in the compact. Uh, this proposal is good for Racine, it's good for Wisconsin, and we ask that you approve it. Thank you for your time, for your consideration, and uh, for your continued service to our state. Thank you. After Eric Hansen, we'll call on Ed St. Peter. Is Eric Hansen here and would like to speak? Uh, if not, I'll keep this appearance slip here in case uh, he stepped out for a minute, but uh, otherwise we'll go on to Ed St. Peter. Hi, my name is Ed St. Peter, address 4401 Bay Road, Kenosha, Wisconsin. I'm the general manager of the Kenosha Water Utility, Keith's neighbor. I've been with the utility for 47 years, so I have a lot of historical experience with diversions. Kenosha's been diverting water since the 1960s. Our total approved, already approved diversion level is almost double the amount that we're seeing is applying for. Just to put it in perspective, that Kenosha can divert currently almost 14 million gallons of water. Racine is asking for seven. The only thing I'm trying to put in perspective is this amount of water. The city of Chicago has a diversion that's been approved by the U.S. Supreme Court 
to divert 2.1, not million, but 2.1 billion gallons of water per day. They divert in one day, in, the, in two and a half days, as much water as Kenosha treats total in total. We treat five billion gallons of water a day. So with diversion of 2.1 billion from Chicago, this seven million gallons, of which the majority is still coming back, is really, I don't want to say irrelevant, but close. So, so the issue of how much water is being lost out of the Great Lakes Basin, I think, is really so minimal, it's almost the minimus. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll call on Gary Chafee, and then after that, Jennifer uh, Gigridge. Hi, I'm Gary Chafee. Um, my address is 49 37th Street, Racine, Wisconsin, technically Mount Pleasant. Um, they're going to be building the facility right across the street from my parents' house. Uh, so we are de hopefully denied a request of a diversion due to the lack of public transparency provided by Foxconn and exactly what chemicals are being used and what Foxconn's free treatment applications will be. I am a chemist uh, from the University of Wisconsin Whitewater. I currently work in chemical stains and dyes manufacturing production. Uh, we treat a very large amount of wastewater that contains zinc and chromium. And we follow the exact very, very strict guidelines in Milwaukee. Uh, our new plant is gonna be moving to, to Sheboygan. And we also have to follow very, very strict uh, applications to our wastewater. And one thing I urge you, if you do propose this, that you treat them just as strictly, strictly, even though that the governor has lined his pockets with their money. I also hope that the groundwater, wondering what the groundwater water impacts would be due to the version, seeing that almost every single home in that entire area relies on well water and groundwater as their viable drinking water. A lot of the issues tonight have been talk, talked about diverging water from the city of Racine and back to the city of Racine, but nothing about what contaminants could lie in the groundwater if there were a leak. Because um, that eventually could go in the water table and eventually make its way to the Great, Lake, Great Lakes Basin if it is not caught in time. Um, I don't really have much more to say other than I hope you deny it. A lot of chemicals that have will be used in liquid crystals and LCDs have already been explained. And I hope you have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, after Jennifer Gigrich, we'll call on Allison Werner. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jennifer Gigrich. I'm the Government Affairs Director for the Wisconsin League of Conservation Voters. Uh, we're a statewide advocacy organization that works to connect local citizens to your decision makers on natural resource decisions. Um, I am here tonight because the Great Lakes uh, contain 20% of the world's fresh water and 90% of North America's fresh water. And that is why in 2008, um, Wisconsin and other Great Lakes states and provinces got together to put together a framework for managing this critical resource for the long term. Back at that point, there was a lot of uh, foreign companies looking at um, coming in and bottling water. There were thirsty states and nations looking at how to take advantage of this wonderful resource that we have here. And one of the things that we realized is that if we are not good stewards of this resource ourselves, and we are not transparent about how we use that water, and using it specifically for people and our communities, then we had no legal leg to stand on when other people wanted to come and take that water. And so tonight, the decision before us is about this uh, diversion from Racine, but it's also about the future, which is what so many people have said. And I have to be honest with you, and, I'm, and when, I, when I say you, I, I don't mean the, the staff at DNR, because I realize this is not your um, decision to bring this forward, but this application being put in at the time that it was with the information that was available publicly about the overall project is the very scenario that we were all so worried about when we passed the Great Lakes Compact. You have a foreign company that is outside the Great Lakes Basin applying for water for the Stradlin community that has very few residential users 
going through a city that has that, that use already. If we allow this to happen, it is going to happen all over the basin with other states, and then it's going to be the other thirsty states and nations and corporations who come. And we're not going to have a leg to stand on. This is not cut and dry. This isn't even close. We ask you to reject this diversion, and we ask you to we ask the people who are asking for it to be realistic about who is at, is at stake here and our future for all of Wisconsin, for all of the Great Lakes states. Because this is our future, and if we don't do it right, and March 21st is not enough time to figure out something this major, then we are going to lose every opportunity we have to protect this thing that has made Wisconsin such a great place to live. Thank you. All right, after Allison Werner, we'll call on John, and I'm sorry, I'm going to mispronounce this, but C R I M M something. Does that, you know who you are? Thank you. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak today. And so many folks have spoken so eloquently today and covered, I think, every issue we wanted to bring up. Um, I want to thank our colleagues from League of Conservation Voters and Midwest Environmental Advocates and League of Women Voters. They very much covered all of the issues. Uh, we wanted to bring tonight, I know there's many people to speak yet, so I'm just going to emphasize a couple and stress that we are also, uh, I should say, Allison Warner with River Alliance of Wisconsin, and uh, we are a statewide organization uh, of concerned citizens who work to protect our waters across the state. And we are also asking that the Department of Natural Resources deny this uh, request from the city of Racine for the diversion of water. Um, you've heard tonight so much about the significance of the precedent here, and we couldn't agree more. This, this is a major decision that needs time to be taken to make sure we are following the Great Lakes Compact as intended. And we do believe that this request is, is a new diversion. You know, the city of Kenosha and Racine, it's folks who've been talking about the amount of water withdrawn from the Great Lakes currently, they're for existing uses, mostly for real. We're hearing about the number of residents or people that are receiving this water. This is a new diversion request for a corporation, and we do feel it violates the intent of the compact, as you've heard a couple times tonight, that quote of it's for solely for public water supply purposes. We feel that intent is not being met here. Uh, we also agree with the folks who've talked about the amount of consumptive use, that the 40% is a large number and should be taken a look at. Uh, while, yes, it was talked about tonight about pre-treatment of the water uh, that would be leaving Fox Con, we feel that detail is something that should be made up front. We should know ahead of time what is going to need to be handled with that pre-treatment. And the mention today of uh, also, the solid waste or the sludge that may be one of the byproducts of what is left at Foxconn, those details should be known ahead of time as well. This is a large facility with a lot of risk, and these details should be known before this diversion application is granted. Uh, so thank you for your time and consideration, and to all the people who came today to share these concerns. Thank you so much. Uh, after John, we'll call on Harold Wadica. My name is John Crimmings. Uh, I'm the general manager of First Rubber Real Estate in Racine. I've had the distinct pleasure of uh, selling Racine County for 41 years. And um, I guess, first of all, I urge you to, to pass the, the, the request and allow the diversion. Um, one of the primary reasons or primary benefits of uh, a, a company like Botscon is, is, is obvious. It's a, it's a employment source and it brings people into the area. But balanced with that is the beauty of Racine County and the natural beauty of Lake Michigan and other lakes and and uh, and, and uh, rivers in the area. And there's nobody uh, that I'm hearing in this room that is willing to put that at jeopardy. I guess I look upon the fact that. The reason we're even in Racine is the combination of industry and water that has been going on since at least the beginning of the state. Uh, as Mr. Haas uh, alluded to earlier, um, we are very, very fortunate that we have the utility led by Keith and, and his people that is so conscious of environmental issues. Uh, 
as Keith mentioned, he's made uh, great strides, and we, as a as a community and as a uh, as just environmentalists in general, have recognized the beauty and the value of clean environment. And as I said, I don't believe anybody is putting that at risk. I think what we're trying to do is create a balance that allows for economic development and jobs and uh, family supporting jobs to coexist with nature and to take advantage of the beauty of the natural environment that we have. Uh, I think great care has been done to do that. Um, and again, if, if, uh, if I can take any solace in uh, the environmental issues, is the fact that it's, the, the Fox County is relocating in, or locating in Racine County and is, uh, is going to be under operating under the watchful eye of the Racine Water Utility, which is primarily developed, uh, designed and developed to help preserve our Great Lake. Uh, so again, I, I urge you to please um, look favorably upon the application. I think it is vital to the future of Racine County and for Southeast Wisconsin. And I believe that, uh, that through the works of, of local government and the water utility, that the balance between the industry and uh, the environment can be met. Thank you for your time. Thank you. All right, after Harold, we'll call on Karen Hobbs. Carol Ludica. I was born in Racine. I'm not a resident now. But over the uh, last six months, I had an opportunity. I'm with Clean Water Engineering. And I had an opportunity to work as an ANSI representative, part of their, te part of their team, in an effort uh, with the Gates Foundation in Africa uh, to create a standard for an off-the-grid fecal-based treatment system. So. I'm a mechanical guy, I'm not a chemist, but there were 28 nations, 65 representatives that were experts in uh, chemical discharge levels because when you're discharging wastewater, there's always going to be residual elements from the original uh, wastewater, even after treatment. In the Great Lakes, we're just cleaning this lake up. This lake was polluted for years and years and years by industry. You go to Africa and see where strip mining was and see what happened there. If we waste this opportunity to preserve this lake, it won't come back for a long, long time. And what we have to do after, after being involved with all these brilliant, brilliant scientists from all over the world, what I concluded is that you have to look at the cumulative effect and they're not going to use 7 million gallons of water in their cooling towers. They're going to be creating colloidal, colloidal <laughs> silica. They're going to be creating a lot of, as everyone else has said here, they're going to be using a lot of solvents and other products. And I know wastewater discharge. The DNR does a wonderful job of monitoring it. But the problem is there still are elements of these metals phosphates and other elements that are allowed as long as they're under a certain level. If you're discharging this great deal of wastewater into the Great Lakes, even after treatment, there will be some residual elements from that wastewater that will go there will just be below an acceptable threshold. But think of the volume, the volume of that, the cumulative effect over the next hundred years in that lake allowing those metals and toxins in. Africa, every country person I spoke with when I was there would love to have our water, but if we don't preserve it, we will be in the same position there. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, after we'll call on Melissa Warren. Good evening. Thank you again for giving the opportunity to testify before you today. My name is Karen Hobbs. I'm the Senior Director of Midwest Advocacy at the Natural Resources Defense Council, or NRDC. I should note that I live in the city of Chicago, but I am here representing the 50,000 members and online activists who live in Wisconsin and are part of NRDC. And I also represent the broader base of the community concerned about this application. Uh, in addition to uh, my testimony this evening, I will also be submitting written comments. And I had planned to touch on two areas of concern with the application, both related to compliance of the compact. Given that the first, 
regarding the violation of the definition of public water supply was covered by Jody habish simikin I won't repeat that, but I'll spend my second concern, which is with the complex requirement for the implementation of environmentally sound and economically feasible conservation measures. The compact recognizes the economic and environmental advantages of effective water resource management. Wisconsin statute imposes three different tiers of water conservation and efficiency based on the volume of water withdrawn. Indeed, NRDC has lauded Wisconsin's conservation and efficiency program and its requirements as an example for other states across the basin and across the country. In Wisconsin's program, the definition of tier three withdrawals apply to new or increased diversions of Great Lakes water and new or increased water withdrawals statewide that result in a water loss of more than two million gallons per day, averaged over 30 days. The application before you estimates a daily use and maximum buildup of up to seven million gallons per day, with an estimated consumptive loss of 2.7 million gallons a day. The application does not identify specific conservation measures that the manufacturing facility will undertake to comply with the tier three requirements for conservation and efficiency. And moreover, the application fails to identify specific measures for any industrial and manufacturing customers, focusing instead on reducing residential use and implementing educational programs. Despite the fact that the application itself identifies manufacturing as a main purpose for the diversion. This is a violation of the compact and Wisconsin statute, as well as a missed opportunity to really create a state-of-the-art facility. The Great Lakes Compact stands as a singular achievement in Great Lakes governance, but the true test of the compact is in the states and the region's continued commitment to its full implementation. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. After Melissa Warner, we'll call on Susan Johnson. Hi, I'm Melissa Warner. I'm a volunteer with the John Muir chapter of the Sierra Club. Uh, we represent 50,000 members and supporters living throughout the state. And we advocate for the fair and rational management of our common resources so that all Wisconsin residents have access to the clean air, water, and land we all need to move our economy forward. And thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Our area has water. In fact, water is often touted as our greatest asset. Fox Town came here because of water. That's not a surprise that they're now asking for it. And we are not opposed to the project per se. We recognize it as the potential to bring economic benefits to the region. Nevertheless, we want the project to follow the rules. And as Jody has carefully pointed out, um, Fox Town has already been granted many waivers and exceptions on other rules that many other companies have to follow. So based on our understanding of state law, we do not believe that this diversion request is in fact following the rules. A straddling community uh, may um, be accepted from the prohibition on diversion if all the water so transferred shall be used solely for public purposes and Wisconsin statute 281.343 parentheses, one E parentheses PM says that public water supply purposes are for largely residential customers that may also serve industrial, commercial, and other institutional operators. And we, if, in our opinion, if you want to approve it, you've got to find a way around that definition. We would not be here at all if Foxconn had decided on a site slightly farther east, because then they would be in the basin and they wouldn't have to ask. As far as I'm concerned personally, I suspect somebody just really wasn't paying attention. And, or was so certain that an exception would be granted that they simply did not read the provisions carefully. Your decision here, or not here, but on this issue, affects all 10 Great Lakes states and provinces. If we make an exception here, it's a little wibbly wobbly, then every other straddling community entirely all around the lake can do the exact same thing. And we are concerned also about how this will affect the authority, stability, and enforceability of the compact. Thank you. Thank you. Somebody had a good idea that uh, I should name a few more speakers because I understand some are in the overflow room and it might take a little longer to get here. So I'm going to just uh, name the, the next three that we've got on deck here. Uh, Susan Johnson and, and then Cheryl Nen and Philip Colloran. Cheryl Nen with Milwaukee Riverkeeper. 
um, and we're encouraging you to deny this application tonight. Um, as others have said, the Great Lakes Compact, um, the goal is really to keep the Great Lakes water in the Great Lakes. And only 1% of the Great Lakes are renewable. So we need to ensure that we're essentially not taking out more than we're putting back in, or we threaten the water supply for 40 million people. Um, as you see in your presentation, the compact bans diversions with very limited exceptions, that being um, for Stradlin communities and communities in Stradlin counties. Racine is neither of these and not eligible to apply for this diversion in our opinion. When New Berlin applied for a Stradlin community diversion, they were the applicant. The city of Milwaukee as the water supplier to New Berlin did not apply for that except that, that diversion. So we're concerned about why in this case um, Racine is, is doing this. Um, the compact, as others have said, also says diverted water should be for public water supply purposes only. Um, clearly Mount Pleasant um, would not, uh, you know, essentially meet that bar in this case because they don't have a public water supply. And this diversion is for a private company, as others have mentioned, and thus not for a public water supply. So it seems like the reason that Mount Pleasant isn't applying for the diversion in this case is because, you know, they would not be able to meet that bar that this is for a public water supply. Um, it is largely to supply Foxconn, which is a private company. So our concern is if we let Racine apply for a business outside of the Great Lakes Basin in this case, because they have excess water capacity, what is to stop a whole line of businesses from setting up shop from Racine to Milwaukee to Green Bay, right outside the Great Lakes Basin line looking for water? And let's be clear, all of our Great Lakes cities have excess water capacity. <laughs> Racine has excess water capacity, Milwaukee does, Green Bay does. You know, and you can follow that situation all throughout the Great Lakes, Cleveland, Detroit. We have a lot of cities where we've lost a lot of industry, we have plenty of water. So I'm very concerned about the precedent of allowing a water supplying city to apply for a diversion to a company outside the Great Lakes Basin. And I think that seriously could set a very bad precedent for the Great Lakes Compact and cumulatively um, could uh, lead to very high consumptive use of the Great Lakes. Um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Philip Halloran, and then Tim Fulton, and then Glenn Warren. Good evening, Phil Halloran, uh, 6018 Third Avenue, Kenosha. I've never been prouder of being a, a Wisconsin person than now. Uh, I think that um, there's just a few things that haven't been said. A strict reading of the um, application reveals that uh, Foxconn's numbers, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the numbers having to do with the uh, actual, not remediation, but the actual uh, usage, uh, are uh, those presented by their attorneys, it would appear, uh, that is to say, um, the uh, entities that are not engineering firms, uh, that were uh, simply providing uh, data to the engineering firm that drafted the application. Uh, I submit to you that, um, and when I asked for a clarification on what it was that was asked uh, of the uh, of the utility in addition more recently uh, about those numbers, that those numbers really must be carefully scrutinized. And I submit that it's reasonable to expect that the numbers that an entity the likes of Foxconn and an entity for as large a project as this, such as the uh, Racine utility, would be using engineering data in order to be able to forecast what the consumption rates are. And I submit that on page 23 of the uh, application, it's clear that the numbers are less than, uh, uh, less than detailed, shall we say, as well. And, and I understand it's not the DNR's uh, uh, intent tonight to explore remediation as much as it is the actual diversion itself. But that said, I think that you need to take careful attention to the fact that given that this is a tier three entity, clearly, uh, by, by statute, as far as my, that's my personal view of it, that you uh, have to examine the uh, state-of-the-art remediation methods uh, by which the, the uh, company will, will be remediating the, uh, the outflow. That said, um, that none of that is in there. It's all would do this, would do that, and if indeed they use a, a particular method, uh, particularly, uh, and I don't want to belabor the record here, nor take up any more of your time, uh, but if, for example, thanks. Spent 
contributing to today's reading list. Referring you again to page 23, it states, um, a fax can would use a heat exchange process to cool a separate closed water uh, cooling loop and would evaporate approximately 2.1 mega, mega or a million gallons. If a liquid discharge system is used to process wastewater, the diversion volume will substantially lower the amount. Well, are they going to use the liquid discharge system or not? Sir, no, I'll, I'll ask clear you on page conclude, 20, please, just so we can make sure to get to everyone. I'll have to be a stickler on time, but please feel free to submit those comments. In I will. I'll be submitting. Thank you. Today. Thank you. All right. Uh, Tim Fulton will be next, and then Glenn Warren, and then Dan Tyson. Is there no uh, Tim Fulton here? All right. I'll save that appearance slip in case he had to come from the other room. So we'll call in Glenn Warren, please. And then after Dan Tyson, uh, we'll have Joe uh, Dubaniwick. Joe Dubaniwick to a wave. Yes, sounds that, that, Thank you. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Okay. Hello, thank you for allowing me to comment. My name is Glenn Warren. I am a retired environmental scientist who has spent 40 years working on the Great Lakes. Um, I'm concerned, first of all, with the amount and the unprecedented level of diversion for a strictly commercial and industrial um, use. Um, I think that is not something that the compact, those who wrote the compact, uh, expected to happen. Um, and I'm also concerned with the pollutants that will come from the plant and into the lake. Besides uh, comments to the effect here that there are technologies that can remove 100% of heavy metals or um, solids, contaminants. Those are expensive processes. Um, in the 40 years I worked on the Great Lakes, I saw the contaminant levels improve greatly. Um, and I worry that, especially in the local areas where the effluent will enter the lake, that there will be problems associated with heavy metal accumulation and perhaps um, organic compounds, perfluoridated compounds, things like that, that are used in the manufacturing process. Um, I hope that you do not approve this application, and thank you for your time. Thank you very much. So we'll call on Dan Tyson, and then Joe, <laughs> who knows who he is, and James uh, Gensler. Good evening. My name is Dan Tyson. I've been a resident of Mount Pleasant for the past 26 years. For the past 36 years, I've been employed by a local company servicing manufacturing plants throughout Racine, Kenosha, Milwaukee, as well as eastern Wisconsin and northern Illinois. Over those years, I, as well as many of you, have seen countless companies either leave the area or go out of business. By doing so, they have taken, taken hundreds, if not thousands, of job opportunities for our young people with them. Foxconn gives the people of those counties and the entire region from Milwaukee to Chicago some hope and a chance for security. Not only Foxconn, but the other businesses that will support them as well. This has the potential to be a game changer for us all. Just to give you a sense of how much water that is involved here, if you take Lake Michigan, compared to a 24-foot round pool four feet deep, the amount needed for Foxconn would equivalent per day would, it would equate to 1.5 thousandths of an ounce. That's how much water is in Lake Michigan. All of us are concerned about the condition of Lake Michigan and keeping it in tip-top shape. Foxconn has said they will treat the water and return it to the treatment plant where they're going to go back into Lake Michigan. We keep using this word divert, 
We're not diverting the water. We're simply using it and returning it to its origin. This truly could be, this truly has potential to affect the lives of thousands of people in a positive way. One reader, one reader before talked about 100 years. I truly hope that Foxconn is around 100 years from now and is successful. I ask that the DNR approve this proposal. Thank you. Thank you. All right, after our next speaker, uh, Joe, then we'll have James Gensler. And then I'm going to just call on the other appearance slips where somebody didn't come just to make sure that they weren't in the overflow room and couldn't get here in time. Uh, Tim Fulton, Susan Johnson, and, or Eric Hansen, if you are here and would still like to speak, uh, please feel free to do so after James Gensler. Otherwise, we'll call on Joe uh, Duvenayway. Just wave. You'll wave? Okay, very good. Okay, James Gensler, please. My name is James Gensler. I'm a resident of Milwaukee County. Technology and science has been expanding at exponential rates, and it's hard for every one of us to keep track of it, and especially following to make sure that we follow in a right and due course. What I'm really referring to is nanotechnology. Nanotechnology has entered into all phases of our life and our exposure from cosmetics to household goods to cleaning solutions, which is phenomenal as far as keeping things clean and referring to technology in the industry that's going to be moving here. Taking that into consideration, there are pros and cons, just as for instance, fire. Fire we all appreciate in heating our homes, but at the other hand, it, it burns out thousands and millions of acres of forest land and destroys people. So there are pros and cons to fire. The same thing applies to nanotechnology. We know that the silver particles in nanotechnology is great for purifying water, and it's great for water systems. But on the other hand, once it gets into the water system and contaminates, there are certain things that are very harmful. And I'm talking about in nanoparticles, we're talking about silver, uh, titanium oxide, and zinc oxide, which according to a, a study that's been done by John Hopkins University, and the John Hopkins University, uh, their uh, Bloomberg School of Public Health indicates that we found the different nanoparticles resulting in various degrees of cellular toxo toxo toxicity, with some exposure lead to cell death and to others subtle, uh, subtle, uh, cell, subtle signs of cell stress. It also gets into the DNA. And when we talk in terms of mitochondria, these nanoparticles are so small they go through into, the, into the, the mitochondria and destroys the cell itself. So whatever we do, we have to be very careful about our water. I don't care if it's Racine, if it's Kenosha, Milwaukee, Chicago. Nanoparticles are very de destructive to human cells, to all life forms, that is vegetation or any of the water life or human beings. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much. So next we'll call on Ken Anderson, and then Mark Sheldon, and then Joseph Kramer. And since I didn't uh, announce Ken with enough time to give, him, uh, to give him some advance notice, oh, you're right here in the front row. Yep, you're, there you go. Okay. Uh, that was a, a little bit of a shock for me. Uh, 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 Thanks for the opportunity to speak tonight. Uh, my name's Ken Anderson, I'm from Genoa City, Wisconsin. I wanna go on the record as uh, opposing the uh, diversion project. Uh, as uh, uh, a number of people have stated to, uh, tonight that uh, according to the uh, compact, uh, the water being diverted from a public use facility it's not for public use. What the uh, water is being used for is, is for private, uh, for a, one of the world's largest corporations for private 
monetary profit. And I think that that's one of the main reasons it should be. Uh, this diversion project sh should be dismissed in itself. Uh, secondly, the heavy metals, which have been alluded to all evening, the chromium, the zinc, and, and who knows what, I don't even know that Foxconn has announced what nasty contaminants and pollutants are, are in the process uh, of their manufacturing. Uh, we, we're, we're speaking of chromium and copper and zinc and lead. Could there be mercury uh, uh, and, 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 and others? Uh, that, and, and I think this is a, a serious concern. When we talk about polluting uh, Lake Michigan with contaminants such as the ones that have been aforementioned, we're not talking about pounds. We're talking about parts per million or even billions, such as lead in Flint, Michigan, where 15 parts per billion was toxic and stayed in one system forever, and in, in some cases causing death and serious illnesses for individuals for the rest of their life. Uh, as far as uh, mitigating the uh, marshlands, well, that's one issue, but I understand that Foxconn is going to be burying street beds which uh, probably are lined with sand and gravel, which make a natural conduit right straight to Lake Michigan, but you won't see it because it's under asphalt or soil that's been filled in. And I think uh, that's, uh, uh, that needs to be addressed. Uh, I'm gonna divert a little bit here and say that I would have expected Foxconn to make a statement here tonight at the, at the hearing. And I would expect that being, uh, if they want to be a good neighbor, that's what they should do. Of those who supported the project tonight, of those who supported the project tonight, I found it outstandingly interesting that they all had dollar signs in their eyes. Um, the negative precedent being set by allowing this to proceed is atrocious. And, and then it'll affect the whole great lake space. I'm uh, sorry. Thank you. Writing them. Thank you. All right. Uh, so, everyone, I was just about to compliment the audience because you've been a very, very courteous audience tonight, and thank you for continuing to do so and keeping your applause, you're using restraint with your applause so that everyone feels comfortable, no matter what their viewpoint is. People are being very civil tonight, and I really appreciate your courtesy. So please keep it up. Thank you. All right, so Mark Sheldon. Yeah, my name is Mark. Actually, Dr. Mark Hill Sheldon. I'm from Burlington, Wisconsin. My doctoral work is in education and organizational leadership. I'm a retired educator. You know, uh, this whole thing tonight reminds me and I think something a lot of people can agree on is that we have a crisis in leadership in this country. And I know that uh, what I've learned to do over the last years is to ask leaders to do things in policy and legislation that will protect the citizens and the environment. The environment is us. And to ignore that in favor of short-term monetary benefits is short-sighted, to say the least. We need to know that our children and grandchildren and future generations that have been so well described here earlier tonight will look upon us as to whether our government acted responsibly. We need to be strident, and the leaders need to be strident, to keep harm from those who are their constituents and the environment. So let me ask you, as we hear leaders tonight come up and say, it's going to be okay, trust us. But at the same time, we hear that in the application, there is nothing, and by the way, I've been on the phone with several DNR people. I was on the phone with Mr. Hess, who's a fine person, does a nice job in receiving the water treatment. But no one could tell me, oh, we don't know what will be the contaminants, how they're going to pre-treat it, what they're going to do with the waste that they glean from their pre-treatment. 
Is that going to go underground at the site, like Ken had indicated, perhaps it might? Why, why aren't the leaders here tonight coming out and saying, you know, doggone it, we got your backs. We're going to make sure that we have this stuff nailed down before we approve, before we urge to approve. And we're asking the DNR as a non-political entity to look at it in that fashion. And the same thing as was said as far as the compact, the Great Lake Compact is concerned about public water, public use of the diversion of water being a criteria. Nothing in there about private industry coming in and taking 7 million gallons a day. Also, the leaders need to stand up and take a strident view about the lax and the waiving of those short and long-term requirements, especially those that would have us do environmental impact studies. Where are the environmental impact studies? We have scientists coming up tonight saying, don't do this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right. I think that there's a gentleman here who was in one of the earlier parent slips, maybe, that uh, when I called on him, we missed. So what's your I name, sir? I called on him, but I got to step Oh, OK. Sure. What's your name? My name is Gordon Johnson. I'm from Green Bay, Wisconsin, up north. Thank you. Um, a couple of things. There are laws, federal laws and state regulations and laws limiting what can be discharged by an industry to a public treatment works. Um, that being said, you can take just about anything out uh, of the water that a process puts into the water to make it acceptable by the POTW, publicly owned treatment works, which would, would be received. Uh, I believe that's Mr. Haas. Another question I have is, Mr. Haas, can you set the limits because you're accepting that water to perhaps uh, tighter limits than your uh, pollution, uh, pollution elimination discharge standard? In other words, let's say you can discharge 1.6 parts per million of zinc. I'm not sure what it really is. Could you set a tighter limit for that for Foxconn just to ensure that there is some uh, so yeah. if they should mistreat something for a brief period of time. I, I don't know the answer to that. That's just a question. Um, but I do know that whatever Mr. Haas has to discharge to the Great Lakes will be no different than any other industry that feeds wastewater to him. That being said, if, if Foxconn had located a mile east of here, there would, we wouldn't even having this meeting, there would be no issue with them using that 7 million gallons of water per day. Uh, it's just that they located where they did a relatively rural area so they didn't have to uh, disrupt a community or a, a subdivision, subdivision or something. Uh, so they would still be using the water if they were east of here. So that really shouldn't enter into it. It's kind of up to the lawyers to parse out whether the usage uh, is public or private. And that's about right, what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so we'll call on Joseph Kramer, and then Keel Erlinson, and then Fran Martin. privilege to uh, participate in something like this. Uh, I'm, I drove here today from our home in Sister Bay. Like all of you, I love the water and the lakes. They're precious. Uh, but uh, in, in the context of everyone speaking how bounteous our lakes are, how much water there is, I want to remind you that about five years ago, uh, we were having harpers dredged and the water was way down so it can come up and it can come down. The whole, and across the world now, it's known that, that scarce, the water is getting scarcer and scarcer and scarcer. So uh, uh, 
I think that uh, I urge you to consider this. If you, uh, Foxconn and our local uh, government found ways to make a, a, a proposal that's being seriously considered. It, uh, it has high consumptive use, and uh, I hope you won't approve it because I think it will form a precedent. It will, be, it will become a case study, and you will have a parade of Foxconns coming to you for similar, and they'll look at what was done here. They'll figure out what was done and how they made it palatable and uh, get serious consideration. And they'll be Foxconn after Foxconn after Foxconn. They'll have their lawyers looking at how this was done. They'll say, oh, here we can do this better, that better. It will be a fearsome precedent. That's my belief, and that's why I urge you to not approve this application. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, so Keel Erlinson and then Fran Martin and then Bet or Betty McCauley. Yes, I'm uh, Cheryl Erlinson and my wife and I uh, live in Caledonia. And um, well, I did, I do have sound engineering background. I'm not here as an expert, but I'm here as a concerned citizen and a taxpayer. I read the application, and um, I think it's time that we look at some alternatives. I think we should require the Foxconn clean up their water on site, recycle it, and send zero process water to the lake. The technology exists, and the idea of zero waste water actually was mentioned in the application. And we also have to keep in mind there will be more applications like this linked to the Foxconn project. And also our leaders in the state, they talked about this being transformative for the region, which means that they will try to develop a lot of industry in the electronics area. And electronics is, manufacturing is well known for uh, high water usage. It's, you know, that's why Foxconn is asking for so much water. And, um, what is requested here by Racine is the withdrawal of enough water to supply a city of more than 60,000 people. And there is a chance that there will be another 60,000 people brought in as this region transforms. And as I read the Great Lakes Compact, the proposed water use violates the public water supply definition of the compact. Public water supply is water to quote serve a group of largely residential customers and that may also serve industrial commercial and other institutional customers in this case it's upside down it's dominantly serving a private industrial customer and residential use is just a minor portion of the overall number and plans and projections have been prepared by consultants. And as we all know, when it comes to implement the plans, there are contingencies and overruns. And um, I think that if we allow this much water back and forth between leg and back, uh, there's going to be a lot of cost overruns. And, uh, and I think those overruns should be owned by Foxconn and not by the citizens in the area. And that's why I think treating the water on site and reusing it is what we should require Foxconn to do. Thank you. Thanks so much. All right, so Fran Martin and then uh, Ben McCauley and Michael Carbon. Hi, my name is Fran Martin and I live in Caledonia and I'm here really with a brief comment about the process, not so much about the merits of what's going on. It, it's, a, it's a juggernaut. Foxconn has become, Foxconn has become a juggernaut. There's so much 
political capital that's been expended. There's so much expense. There's so many dollars that have been expended. And you're here to make a decision. And I'm asking you, however you can, to have the DNR isolate itself from that political pressure and to make a decision on the basis of the merits of what you've heard and the merits of the decision, including should you decide to grant this, monitoring the wastewater afterwards. Because if you have 13,000 jobs dependent on a wastewater facility, should there be an overrun or should there be excess pollutants generated, the pressure to allow that to continue would be tremendous. So I'm asking you to consider the process by which you make this decision, and, and should you make the decision, the process by which you continue to enforce it. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So next, we'll call on Ben McCauley, and then Michael Carmen, and then Alice Irvin. And I'll just make note while our next speaker is coming up that there is some, there are some chairs that have cleared out for people in the overflow room. There, there are a few chairs if you'd like to join us here. Is there a Bet or a Betty McCauley? If not, I'll go on to uh, Michael Carbon. And if there's no Michael Carbon, I'll hold these appearance slips in case they're coming from another room. But Alice Irvin? Thank you. All right, next we'll call on Ezra Meyer, 
and then Ram Bhatia, and then Irene Bialas or Bialas. Good evening. Thank you, everyone, DNR folks, and everyone behind me for being here tonight. I knew it when I predicted, I think talking with one of the reporters on the side over here, that we'd have a good turnout because the Great Lakes are an issue people Wisconsin clearly care a lot about. I'm with Queen, Wisconsin. Uh, we were born on Earth Day and working on Great Lakes issues since our inception uh, over 45 years ago. A lot of great comments have already been made that I won't, won't try to repeat from Mars and Jody from Alice and Werner from Cheryl Mann from Alice who preceded me. But um, I just wanted to you know, get out there. Clint Wisconsin works on Great Lakes issues. We've done that for a long, long time. We're not opposed to diversions. We work with Corey Mason. We work with the legislature. We work part of the mayors up and down the coast in Wisconsin around the basin past the compact the way that it is. It allows diversions, but Shaley said it in rare exceptions. And, they, and we've got to look for the policy. Obviously, you guys are doing that in this one. We want to encourage you to keep it up. Um, the key here is this public water supply purposes issue. You know, um, you're looking at that. We're all looking at that. We're going to submit written comments. We'll dive into the technical details and legal details more, more closely on that. But um, it's a private purpose here. It's really hard to square the realities of the application if water diverted to the small area of the landscape is, isn't for the, res the largely residential purposes of the statutes and of the compact. So we're obviously concerned about that as so many others are. I wanted to echo what Allison from Riverland said about the, uh, the concern about the water quality impacts and about the quantity impacts this consumptive use and making sure that those issues are brought into this process on the approval of the diversion, that the public can have that, all that information in the public and light in public, in public and kind of consider all that as part of the diversion process. I know, um, you know, the diversion proposal so far does a only a very little bit of depth on those in, on those issues, but we want to see that stuff brought forward here if there's any chance that, that that's possible. For this case, for the precedent that sets as people have mentioned, for the cumulative impacts that this kind of proposal could happen, if this becomes a we're going to become the way that we do things going forward, which we're hoping it's not. Uh, we urge the department to uphold the integrity of the Great Lakes Compact here, do the right thing, and, uh, and show us you can do that in this case. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so Ron, Fatia, and then Irene, and then Tom Bueller. Good evening. First of all, thank you for pronouncing my name perfectly. <laughs> My name is Ram Bhatti, I am a resident of Mount Pleasant for over 30 years and I have been a resident of Great Lakes area for over 44 years. I am not an activist, I don't have a free speech, I mean I don't have freedom to speak. I am an engineer. I look at the data and I analyze every issue on its own <coughs> merit. Listening to various speakers, it seemed to me that no matter what we had presented, mostly people who are opposed, they can't give their prepared speech. I'll give you an example. You presented that the application was presented on January 26th. I heard from the speaker saying that the application was, we didn't know about it, we don't have the details about the Foxconn. Folks, I don't think it's about Foxconn. I think it's about not embracing once in a lifetime opportunity. If I can, everything I've heard, the whole issue is can be categorized in three categories. Number one, water diversion, or as some people are saying it, how much water is going to be withdrawn from the lake. Number two, the environment effect, waste water, and number three, who's going to pay for that? So let me quickly uh, summarize what I've heard. Water diversion, as one speaker said, if Foxconn were a few miles east, we wouldn't have this. Area, there will not be any water diversion. We also heard that Chicago is diverting 2.2 billion. We're talking about 7 million. That's, if I do a quick math, 7 million divided by 2.2 billion, that comes to 0 0.0035. So even that issue has no merit. Not, but last or least, the concern about we are drawing the water from Lake Michigan, read the papers, read the data, not the politics, not the activist. Racine County 
over the last 15 years has lost 43 percent. We are we are, we are we are drawing 43 percent less water what we used to do 15 years ago because so many industries have moved out or closed. That's the issue of the water diversion. And total water out of the Great Lakes is about 9 billion gallons a day. Now let's talk about the wastewater. It's not only about seen or foster. All the counties, all the communities around all the Great Lakes, there's so many industries. We have auto industry, we have coal plant, you talk about the chemical industry. And for the last 80 years or over there, Mr. Haas has already outlined all the industry, all the Great Lakes, the government, the DNR, they are doing a fantastic job. They have not let any industry pollute the water as long as you do not make any exception for Foxconn. And I'll ask you to conclude, please. Very concluding. The cost, you presented. They are paying for the pre-treatment plan. They are paying for all the piping. I'm sorry to Thank interrupt you. you. Thank you. All right. So we'll go on to Irene uh, Bialas. Bialas. And then Tom Bueller. And then Taylor Stevens. My original plan was to talk about the compliance aspects tonight. But after having heard all the people talking about not wanting to withdraw water from Lake Michigan or not having Foxconn discharge into Lake Michigan, I felt I should address that issue first. I love Lake Michigan as only somebody who has lived seven decades on the lake at the moment. Having said that, anybody that thinks that the DNR not approving the application will stop Foxconn from coming is smoking something that I'd like to have some of, please. Foxconn will come. It's a done deal, people. There is nobody in that state government that's willing to take Foxconn on at this point. So the question is, where do we get the water? Do we get it from Lake Michigan? Or we get, do we get it from high capacity wells? If you want to see an adverse effect upon the environment in the southeastern Wisconsin region, then let them put up capacity wells that are great enough to withdraw the type of the amount of water that they need. We are already in an area that has a greater water loss annually than any other region in Wisconsin. We have wells in Burlington and Union Grove that contain radium. If you want to see an adverse effect upon the rivers, including the Southern Fox, then let them do the high capacity wells. So high capacity wells are not the answer. I had a discussion with NOAA, uh, the National Oce Oceanographic Associ uh, Agency, a couple of years back, and I was given great assurances that there is plenty of water in Lake Michigan to sustain development. So the, the amount of water is there. What we have to address, and we have to address whether the water comes from the lake or from a well, is discharge. That's where it is. And the devil is in the details. And I would call upon the DNR to hold the application in abeyance and draft regulations that will address not only the water that they're sampling, but the infrastructure at, at Foxconn. Is that infrastructure sufficient to support the discharges that, 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 that are going on? Because you have noticed that in the problems that we've had with water, be it in the ocean or on uh, the continents, it's when there have been failures in the system. So address that infrastructure. Get in there and do a receive DNR uh, banking. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. So next we'll call on Tom Bueller, and then Taylor Stevens, and then uh, Alexandra Rupnow. Good evening, my name is Tom Bueller. I live at 3314 Rosewood Lane in the village of Caledonia. 
and I am the director and vice president of Butterbuds Inc. We are a medium-sized manufacturer of food ingredients here in Racine. And uh, we are one of 80 companies in Racine that operates a pre-treatment system to uh, make our water fit the uh, requirements of Racine wastewater utility system. And uh, I can tell you it wasn't cheap. But I can also say that the quality of water that we return to Lake Michigan is a very high quality. Uh, the Racine Wastewater Utility System is an excellent watchdog, and the system works. The arrival of Foxconn is not without its downsides. For example, we are concerned about finding employees of the future. We know that's going to be difficult. But I believe the standards in place in terms of wastewater are sufficient to protect Lake Michigan. The way I see it, unless we're all willing to give up our cell phones and our widescreen TVs, Foxconn is going to make LCDs. And I think it's best that they do it here because we have a very good system and we'll be very good at keeping our eye on them. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next we'll call on Taylor Stevens and then Alexandra Rupnow and then Jonathan Roberts. Hello, my name is Taylor Stevens, and I'm a student here from the University of Wisconsin Whitewater, here today to urge the Wisconsin DNR to oppose the Racine Water Diversion Application for Foxconn Development. Racine is requested to divert up to 7 million gallons a day to the diversion area. Just so we're all clear, Racine can currently legally draw up to 60 million gallons a day. They are now asking for the additional 7 million gallons. Under the EPA website on the page, Great Lakes Facts and Figures, it states on the third line that the Great Lakes are the largest surface freshwater system on the Earth. Only the polar ice caps contain more freshwater than the Great Lakes. This precious freshwater can be and will be significantly altered by the introductions of the inconsistencies by the, of the Foxconn operation. We need to ask where is this water going and what is it being utilized for? However, Foxconn would not be possible without the intervention of our governor, Scott Walker. As many people as opposed today, uh, underneath his bill titled Electronics and Information Technology Manufacturing Zone, he outlines a few new regulations and inconsistencies to be laid out. Under current law, all state agencies are required to create an environment, environmental impact statement for every recommendation or proposal that will affect the quality of the human environment. Under this new bill, an environmental impact statement for a manufacturing facility within an electronics and information technology manufacturing zone, or Foxconn, is not a major action or required. In addition, under federal, current federal law, it states that the activities that involve the discharge or fill material to release into navigable water or waters of the United States must comply with guidelines set by the EPA and be issued a permit by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. As the DNR, the current law requires you to issue wetland general permits for discharges of dredged or fill material into certain federal and non-federal wetlands. Under the Great Lakes Compact, Section E, under straddling counties, the department must approve the proposal will not endanger the integrity of Great Lakes Basin ecosystem based upon the determination that the proposal will have no adverse impact on the Great Lakes Basin ecosystem. Without these previous regulations that were held up previously, how can we determine the true threat of this operation? Under this bill, Walker states that a person may, without a permit, discharge dredged material or fill material into a non-federal wetland that is located in the Electronics and Information Technology Manufacturing Zone. There is no company that has been any different than Foxconn before us today. If a production as large as Foxconn plans to take millions of gallons of water out of the Great Lakes every day, how can it, that now has fewer regulations how can we truly say that we know that this is safe? We need to admit and investigate inconsistencies so that we can face problems head on before they happen. The main moment in most of these corporation situations is always jobs. Jobs provide families, and what happens, what, but what happens when technology takes over and jobs are lost through robotic machinery? Tuan is the honorary chairman for Foxconn and states in a press conference that they will reduce our total workforce to less than 50,000 people by the end of this year from just 60,000 staff at the end of 2016. I urge you to deny this application. Thank, Thank you. you so much. All right, so we'll call on Alexander Rupnow, and then Jonathan Roberts, and then Jody Landowski. Good 
Good evening. My name is Alexandra Rupnow, and I'm a student at the University of Wisconsin Whitewater. I personally took a look at the water diversion application. The review criteria for this application states that to be approved for a standing for a straddling community diversion application, Racine must demonstrate the following. The Racine Water and Wastewater Utility is a public water supply system and the water diverted will be used for public water supply purposes. As previous speakers have stated, we now know that the water being used is actually being used for a corporation and not for the public. As far as public benefits go, Foxconn use of the water from the Great Lakes does not benefit the public. The water diverted would only benefit one thing, a private, industrial, and foreign corporation. We must not allow this precedent of allowing water from the Great Lakes to be diverted for the profit of any corporate corporation, especially large-scale foreign companies. What example are we setting for the future? Soon companies will be flocking to take advantage of the Great Lakes, all at the expense of the water, ecosystems, people, and the Great Lakes Compact. I request that the Racine Water and Wastewater Utility be denied permission to divert additional water to be used for Foxconn. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so we'll have Jonathan Roberts, and then Jody Landowski, and then Dennis Krasinski. Hello, my name is Jonathan Roberts. Um, I'm from the bank of Lake Michigan, banks of Lake Michigan, and a student at the University of Wisconsin Whitewater. So many of my statements and points and objections were already made throughout this entire process. Um, and I want to give a huge shout out to all the people that did that for me, and a lot better than I could have ever done. So thank you. But I think it's really important to keep in mind that there are hazardous chemicals and manufacturing processes used in the LCD manufacturing that should be outlined before the decision is made to divert water from the Great Lakes for from Lake Michigan, for Foxconn. We must preserve Lake Michigan and take into account the bioaccumulation of heavy metals and impacts, especially the bioaccumulation of 15 years plus of, um, sorry, I'm blanking a little bit, of um, water um, disposal. We must protect the Great Lakes Compact as well um, and the notion for all diverted water to be for public purposes. Um, no matter the amount of jobs created for Foxconn, the water is going to be used majorly for the profit of a private corporation um, that has a horrible track record for the environment, uh, has a horrible track record for the treatment of its workers, um, and overall is not a corporation that I would like to see and not something that I would like to uh, be in my homeland, especially polluting the environment for future generations. So, for the preservation of the land and our water and the Great Lakes Compact, I strongly urge you guys to not grant permission for Foxconn or the city of the city of Racine to divert seven million gallons of water per day. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right. So next we'll have Jody Landowski and then Dennis Brzezinski and then Sue Grace Krokos. standard? No, meaning DNR believes that this requirement does not apply. A 
However, the applicable section of Wisconsin law corresponding to the compact, and for those of you who care, it's section 281.343, paren 4n, close paren, paren a, close paren 2, regarding diversions for straddling communities, states that a new or increased withdrawal of 100,000 gallons per day or greater, quote, shall also meet the exception standard, close quote. I don't know why you're telling this audience that that standard does not apply. Again, I'm only a lawyer, I'm not a water engineer, I'm not a mathematician, but I believe that 100,000 gallons per day is a lot less than 7 million gallons per day of a diversion is, quote, 100,000 gallons per day or greater, the standard applies. If this represents the level of analysis that the agency is going to give to the application, then I think we're in deep trouble. My concerns regarding the application go beyond this. They track what's been mentioned by a number of other speakers, the application being made by Racine rather than by a straddling community whether four million gallons per day of consumptive use is needed or reasonable, whether all reasonable economic uh, water conservation measures are going to be put in place as the compact requires, and very importantly, whether this diversion is for, quote, public water supply purposes, close quote. It certainly is not being proposed for any large new residential uses. It's for a speculative industrial development for a foreign corporation, along with assorted suppliers. Given the sorry record of Foxconn's environmental and workplace practices overseas, protection of Wisconsin's precious water resources requires full disclosure, careful scrutiny. I urge DNR to deny the application. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so after Sue Grace Kokos, then we'll have John Schultz and then Teresa Cicero. Thank you. My name is Sue Grace Crocus, and I live in Carroll Beach, Wisconsin, and I'm nobody. I came here today to get an answer to my question that I've been asking since the beginning when Foxconn was first put out into the media. And my question was very simple. When a drought happens, who gets the water? Droughts happen. That's an important part of the compact, and as I understand it historically, part of the reason that it was first initiated was because as a, at that point, an owner of a dock on Lake Michigan that no longer was accessible by a boat, I mean, you could walk to it if you didn't mind walking, you know, almost half a mile from the last bit of water you could find. So droughts happen, and it's important to ask that question, at least I thought so. I put that in my paper that I was kind of in between, looking for an answer. And the answer that I got tonight made it really clear that I'm terribly opposed to Foxconn and the diversion. I'm an economist by nature, um, both in my personality and my education, and it comes down to a macro versus a micro issue. Heard a lot about the micro tonight. Oh, it's going to be great for Mount Pleasant, going to be great for the Southeast Wisconsin. It's going to be great, 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 great. And that's the micro part of it. It's great for us. But isn't the DNR stewards? Aren't you supposed to be the stewards that are representing Wisconsin in the compact? When California was in a drought two and a half years ago, I read all kinds of stuff about how we weren't going to send any water to California. Hey, you know, the Sierra Nevada's didn't send you any snow water? Well, it's your problem. We're not going to send you any. We got our compact to worry about. Everybody was pulling together then against Wisconsin. The Taiwanese show up, and all of a sudden, it's me, 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 me. I'm concerned about that. I'm real concerned about it. Because if you pass this, if there is a diversion that's going to be allowed for a Taiwanese company to come into a little tiny town like Mount Pleasant, who doesn't really use a whole lot of public water, and say, oh, it's for Mount Pleasant, how many other thousands of other small communities in the compact by the St. Lawrence, which by the way was deeply impacted by the last drought. I was also kind of reminded of what I was doing 40 years ago, not tonight, mind you, just about 40 years ago, when I lived by Zion, Illinois, 
And a lot of really nice people thought that a nuclear power plant to give us electricity was a really good idea. And we should all not worry about things like nuclear bombs. And you know, what would happen to spent fuel? Because you know, like Yucca Mountain was coming. And there would be like no problem. You do all know it's still there, right? That Zion nuclear power plant that 40 years ago when gravity was still my friend, was it going to be a problem? Good people like you thought, wow, we're going to have power in northern Illinois. Clean, da 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 Except it's still there. And the fuel rods are still there. Thank you. Thank you. I'm John Schultz, and then Teresa Cicero, and then Leah Allen, or Layla Allen. Hello, good evening. Um, well done tonight on organizing and leading this meeting. I'm coming from uh, Temple County, so between La Crosse and Montclair, um, we've had some interesting land use issues there. Uh, a month ago, actually, my, my hometown, the city of Arcadia, won a national award for uh, water quality, well tasting, or water that tastes well. Uh, relating to the you know, sand mining issues that our county has faced. Uh, you know, elections, you know, prove that people want to protect that identity among many others. And water is probably the most foundational of all of all of our economic and ecological values. Um, and I found it <laughs> found it very to come tonight. This is probably the most impactful DNR hearing in state history. Um, you know, what may come of this decision, uh, I think people are going to be uh, paying pretty close attention to it for quite some time. And I want to keep that in mind too, the water quality, the discharge issue is what, what I find really interesting. Is, is anyone asking, and I think we heard that from the mayor of Racine, who was sitting here earlier, um, so I just said. Um, Racine needs to be asking, is it possible for this project to improve water quality? We never really ask that question. How will this economic development perhaps improve <coughs> quality of life, water quality, air quality, etc.? Um, all economic activity is not necessarily economic development, and that's site specific. Uh, <coughs> considering some of the financial costs uh, that statewide we're going to be bearing uh, you know, for this site. That begs a whole other question on, on whether or not it will truly be economic development. Um, that's another point I think people really need to be considering. But again, as citizens, we are responsible for the people that made the decision uh, to allow Foxconn to come to, come to the state. Um, there are elected officials, and we're accountable for our elected officials. Some folks have asked, you know, where are our leaders today? I hope everyone that, that voted. Improving Foxconn bill, um, but at least watch this hearing. It's been very interesting to watch from the other room. People have done a fantastic job, um, raised a number of good points. But again, it's, this is not a burden any of you folks have asked for. It's been handed to you. Um, so please give all these considerations uh, their due. Thank you. Very much. All right, Teresa Cicero, and then Layla Allen, and then Jessica Anderson. Teresa, is that you coming up? No. All right, well, I'll keep her appearance. We'll move on to Layla, Allen, and then Jessica Anderson, and then after that will be Mark Cook. Good evening. My name is Layla Allen. I'm a Milwaukee City resident. Uh, I also work for the City of Milwaukee Health Department. I'm also a National Environmental Health Association accredited registered sanitarian and Kichita Aqua. That means water warrior. <laughs> um, I came here tonight to present some facts. First fact, all of the water that we have is all of the water that we will ever have. We cannot make more. We can, however, destroy it and get less. Second fact, all life forms on our planet require water to continue existence. If we run out of water, we'll have no life. Fact three. There are no jobs on the dead planet. 
Marquette Law School uh, recently conducted a poll about Foxconn, and 62% of those polled thought that uh, Foxconn would have a negative impact on water quality. The DNR's job is to be our stewards, as someone else just recently mentioned. The state must hold our water in trust, the water of the Great Lakes Basin, for our people, not for corporations. While looking over the application for the Racine water um, withdrawal, we found several inconsistencies. The application is asking for permission to draw about 7 million extra gallons per day to accommodate Foxconn and the portions of Mount Pleasant outside the Great Lakes Basin. Racine requests approval to convert it up to an average day use of a full build out in 2050 of 7 million gallons to extend service to customers outside of the Great Lakes Basin. See page 5 of the application. Thus, the total amount needed would be about 24 million gallons per day at full build-out. However, the application also states that in 2016, Racine pumped less than 17 million gallons a day on an average. Racine forecasts an average day diversion volume of 7 million gallons at full build-out. To service all of its customers at full build-out, including customers in the diversion area, Racine forecasts withdrawing 38.9 million gallons on the average day. See page 8 of the application. This forecast is 14.9 million gallons more per day than would be needed. Why would the city of Racine need that much more water? And why is this number not mentioned anywhere else in the application? Even if Racine expects an increase in the economic activity in the area, this is not explicitly stated anywhere in the application and is inconsistent with the amount being asked for in this application. Over 40 million people rely on the Great Lakes for their drinking water. And yet according to the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality's website, Although the total volume in the lakes is vast, an average less than 1% of the waters of the Great Lakes is renewed annually by precipitation, surface water runoff, and inflow from groundwater sources. The Great Lakes Compact was enacted to protect this water for current and future generations. Wisconsin signed on to this international agreement governing consumptive use and water diversions from the Great Lakes. As such, Wisconsin has a duty to protect this water from exploitation. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Next we'll call on Jessica Anderson and then Mark Cook. And then uh, McKaylee Johnson. Hello, my name is Jessica Anderson. I'm a current student at UWSP, uh, Students Point, and home resident um, of Waukesha, Wisconsin. I'd like to voice my concerns about this water diversion proposal that Racine's water utility has made support industrial uses, predominantly for Foxconn's project. We live in an age of industry friendly, economically driven, and politically influenced Wisconsin DNR as a whole. And because of that, it is very likely that this project will still go through, though despite major concerns, risks, and ambiguities surrounding this entire Foxconn fiasco. But let's talk about the issues with it anyways. This project needs to be looked at from every angle and not just economic agendas. We are willing to look past, waive the requirement, for environmental impact statements, how can we be sure that Foxconn will report environmental mistakes? And even if they do, what will they get? A slap on the hand, some sort of mon monetary compensation? No, that is not a punishment for companies with an, uh, enough money to send every city in Wisconsin into a whimpering desire for Foxconn to bring all of its, quote, 13,000 uh, jobs, and how many of these jobs will be for robots? I also would like to comment on the Great Lakes Compact requirements on uh, the diversion. That a straddling community requires a water supply service area plan with footnotes stating, unless the proposal is to provide water to a straddling community that includes an electronics and information technology um, manufacturing zone. Interesting that this footnote is so relevant to this very project. Additionally, using a loophole, Foxconn will receive diverted water from a straddling community Great scene that will provide water to a city, Mount Pleasant, outside of the Great Lakes Basin, avoiding the requirement of not endangering the integrity of the Great Lakes Basin and have no adverse impacts on the Great Lakes, avoiding regional review as they make their consumptive use less than 5 million gallons a day, avoiding a formal technical DNR review, avoiding approval of the Great Lakes Council, other Great Lakes states and provinces, only requiring approval of Scott Walker and DNR, which clearly has economic 
biases and do not consider constituents that sit with worry and despair of the safety of our resources. We cannot simply accept promises made by corporations like Foxconn with its reputation for dirty manufacturing and unrighteous foreign worker treatment policies. We are benighted as industry and corporate rights continue to hold reign over public opinion and public rights. Selling water rights to corporations open up potentials for the permanent holding of a great resource that people need to survive. It's easy to say, eh, Lake Michigan, the Great Lakes are immense, endless reservoirs. There's no way we can run it dry. Well, as water prices grow larger around the world, cities, states, countries will be looking for water. How many states, or how many straws will it take to sip the lakes dry? I will ask you to conclude, please. Thank you. I just demand that leadership isn't driven by power and greed. I demand transparency within our so-called democratic system. And I demand discrepancies in the numbers on the water diversion application to be cleared up. Thank you. All right, so next we'll go to Mark Cook, and then McKaylee Johnson, and then Nate Griswold. Uh, I'm Mark Cook. I go to UW Stevens Point in Stevens Point. Uh, most of what I've had to say today has already been said by a lot of wonderful people that have spoken before me, so I don't want to reiterate too much, but I would like to reiterate that we need to uphold the integrity of the Great Lakes Compact, and that is not allowing water diversion to be used for privatized industries, and I believe that it, allowing that to happen would set a very negative precedent to other communities that border the, the watersheds on the lakes to uh, pretty much tell them that, oh, it's okay to do this. And someone said earlier, I can't remember who, but other companies will look into how Foxconn did, how they avoided the loopholes, or how they, well, how they got the loopholes, essentially. And um, yeah, that's about it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So next we'll go to McKaylee Johnson and then Nate Griswold. And then Dwight Mosley. Hello, my name is Michaela Johnson. I'm a sociology student at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. I oppose this water diversion application or proposal uh, on two counts. First, the first is uh, the amount of water. Uh, as we've heard from many people tonight, uh, how much water that is. Um, I believe that this is too much, and I believe a lot of us feel the same way that this is too much, too much water from our, from our pure Lake Michigan. The second, the second count would be the inappropriate water usage. I don't believe that this, that the water usage will be for the benefit of the citizens of this region. It will be for uh, a large corporation, which, uh, which is something that we do not want in Wisconsin. Our pure Lake Michigan waters could be polluted with heavy metals. Uh, which could be spread to crops, wildlife, and people. The health effects of long-term exposure to these metals that have been seen in China at these other factories include headaches, joint pain, constipation, tiredness, and that's just to name a few. We, the people of Wisconsin, want to create jobs, but not the kind that make people sick and tired. Our industries uplift our people and create economic wealth, and they shouldn't make us sick. Money is not worth dying for. I encourage all of us to simply stop and think about what this water diversion will mean for this state beyond job creation. Look towards the future of our natural resources and our people. We will not allow our water to be tapped. Thank you very much. Next we'll have Nate Griswold and then Dwight Mosby and then Russell Clark. Hello, I'm Nate. I'm from Racine. Um, a lot has been said. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the DNR can actually do about the situation at this point. I don't know what's going to happen. I'm very scared. I'm looking for people to network. I'm looking for people to become engaged, to do whatever you can to shut this thing down because they're not going to listen to us unless we make them. <laughs> uh, citizens are just not involved in real hearings on this issue. Um, they're building things without approval. It's coming. We're not stopping it. But just we need to we need to do something about this. Is all I have to say. I, a giant corporation on top is not going to be good for for our economy. It's really not. We need to help small businesses. And just I'm urging you to do anything you can. So I'm urging you to stop to not to not pass this basically. And I, I just 
Anything you can do to help us in this situation and set precedent is going to be very appreciated. I don't know how much in fact it's actually going to have to stop this. Um, I don't know. Shut these guys down. They're, they're horrible people. But the corporation is bad. He calls his employees dogs. He, he doesn't care about people. And Walker doesn't care about people. And nobody cares about the planet. And we're almost done. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so Dwight Mosby, and then Russell Clark, and then Thomas Taylor. Are any of those gentlemen here? Oh yeah, here comes one. And then after Thomas Taylor, we'll have Todd Brennan. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak this evening. I respect that there are concerns about Racine's diversion application, but from my perspective, as Racine County Board Chairman, this application is great news for the county. It means the return of manufacturing jobs to the region. Racine County has a rich history of manufacturing. J.I. Case, S.C. Johnson's, Incinerator, Modine, Quindis, <coughs> all the names that everybody knows. We have a talented and hardworking residents that have done manufacturing very well in the past. Now with box time, we have a tremendous opportunity to build a new manufacturing leg legacy for in the 21st century. Ever since box time became a possibility for our community, our leadership team has been careful, thoughtful, and worked hard to maximize the benefits for and to protect the Racine County residents and the taxpayers. I see the same thing holding true with this water diversion. Foxconn will be treated the same as any other water user. They have to abide by the regulations set up by the Federal Clean Water Act. They have to abide by the requirements of the Wisconsin DNR's pre-treatment program. Just like any other company, they have to take out local permits they will be monitored by the Racine Wastewater Utility to make sure that the water returned to Lake Michigan is in good quality. It is also important to note Racine's average day water sales would still be below its sales in the mid-1990s, even with the diversion, and it would be much below Racine's pumping capacity. Lake Michigan is truly one of our county's greatest resources that should be protected. This diversion process does just that. I've observed Foxconn very closely throughout the last several months, and one thing is clear. We have a great partner in Foxconn. I anticipate Foxconn will be a good corporate citizen, just like many other good corporate citizens in our community, including the manufacturers I mentioned before. This is a company that is creating thousands of jobs here in Racine County. Those are thousands of people that need to access clean and safe water. I strongly support this diversion to give our community the support it needs while protecting Racine County's most valuable asset. Thank you very much. Sir, can I ask you to just state your name for the record? Russell Clark. Thank you. All right, so next we'll go to Thomas Taylor and then Todd Brennan, and then Russ Potter. Hi. Hi. Uh, my name is Tom Taylor. Uh, my last full job, time job was uh, mayor of the city of Franklin. I was there for three terms. Um, I've also served and been elected as the chairman of the ICC, which is the Milwaukee County Intergovernmental Cooperation Council. I was elected by the mayors and village presidents of Milwaukee to that seat. I have served as an alderman and a county council president, and I have served as uh, the director of personnel for Milwaukee County, and as uh, the assistant director of labor relations for Milwaukee County. One other capacity was a vice president of AFSCME, Mr. Council 48. Um, as the chair of the ICC, uh, I spoke uh, on behalf of the, of the mayors and village presidents some time ago uh, at the state capitol in regards to why the Great Lakes Compact is so good for all the citizens of Milwaukee County and Wisconsin. Our most valuable resource, bar none, is the water in the Great Lakes. It is truly our liquid gold, and I 
stress the word goal because we're talking about economic development. The, the economic development and future of Wisconsin is in the waters of the Great Lakes. Um, I guess I would ask, I understand that there was an application process, I've been through this, and this is not my first public hearing, obviously, um, but I don't find that there's any justification uh, that this hearing has been held uh, because there's no evidence that, unlike, unlike Waukesha, where you had 70,000 reasons, i.e. the people of Waukesha, uh, to have a hearing on this matter, there's no evidence whatsoever to indicate that Foxconn is, in fact, a transformational business. In fact, I would stress that this is not going to generate a Wisconsin Valley. Wisconsin Valley has taken, you know, every municipality in the, in the country, every state says the same thing over and over again. The reality is, Silicon Valley was not built by Intel and Microsoft. Microsoft and Intel located there because of the universities of Berkeley and, and uh, Stanford and because Lawrence Livermore National Lab is, is located there, the inventors of the computer. That's why corporations went to Silicon Valley. It was not the corporations themselves. Um, I would just stress, I know it's a public hearing and we're talking about the Great Lakes Compact, but um, I think it's extremely important, just like in California, that the true environment that is going to produce economic development is investment in education, it's in good roads, it's in infrastructure for the state. That is what will be the magnet for good jobs. Thank you very much. All right, so next we'll go to Todd Brennan, and then Russ Potter, and then Laura Preeby. Good evening. Thank you, Todd Brennan, City of Christine Redison, resident, and also uh, representing the Alliance for the Great Lakes. The Alliance for the Great Lakes wants to make sure that the state of Wisconsin, Wisconsin DNR, and the Walker administration are following the rules of the Great Lakes Compact as it reviews the diversion request to supply Lake Michigan water to Bach Pond. There are state and federal laws in place to protect Great Lakes water quality and quantity, and we need to make sure Wisconsin is adhering to those laws. When Waukesha applied for a diversion for Lake Michigan water, we fought hard to ensure the compact's requirements were met. We will do the same thing for Wisconsin's review of this proposal. As others have stated, this interpretation of public water supply, so transferred, does not comport with the definition nor the spirit in which the compact was created, nor the precedent that has been set in the version exceptions approved for Waukesha and Berlin, two communities largely made up of residential customers. We also encourage you to consider the consumptive loss included in the application and therefore carefully examine and encourage conservation-based alternatives. We also know that Mount Pleasant does not have sufficient money to extend the main lines and encourage you to consider any decision that disproportionately burdens water utility rates for residents, especially those lower socioeconomic citizens that make up a significant portion of our population. Lastly, I strongly encourage you to reconsider your denial of the extension we requested last week. That was the fastest denial I've ever seen in public comments. Thank you. All right, so next we'll go to Russ Potter, and then Laura Preeby, and then Will Lieberson.
that seems to be going on with the political agendas in terms of water. Uh, there isn't any urban planning. Uh, there isn't any long-term discussion about how we're going to plan the future so we can have a large you know, growth and still accommodate or you know, provide um, the needs that those communities are gonna have. Um, this immediate profiteering uh, sounds to me like uh, feeding an old pool with hope that maybe they'll give something back but there's no contract, no guarantees. And in fact, when I look at the voice of the people, um, Foxconn doesn't even care to be here to discuss it. You know, the, it's almost irrelevant. We're here to what, explain our anxieties, get arrested. I mean, what are we here for if we're not going to be represented? And my thought is, the first time I ever found out who Scott Walker was, was it was a church, his church. And um, somebody said, oh, here comes Scott Walker. He's walking down the middle of the aisle just before the minister is up at the pulpit, and he's coming from the back, and he's shaking hands with people. And the person said, he's going to shake hands, let everybody know who he is, and he's going to walk beyond the pulpit and then go out the back door to the parking lot. And sure enough, you can see through the windows, that's what he did. And the problem was, with just that disposition about this whole idea of prayer and you know concern for humanity and the growth of Wisconsin, it's, it's not really there. It, it is uh, completely encapsulated in this one quote that I found in Isaiah 22, 11. And I have to tell you, I'm not a perfect religious person, really. <laughs> but there's a lot of um, meaning in the Bible when you read it for yourself. And, um, and it is a communication that you have to yourself and yourself alone. And, um, and the quote goes, you built a reservoir between two walls for the water of the old pool. But you did not look to the one who made it or have regard for the one who planned it long ago. Thank you. All right, so next we'll go to Will Lieberson and then Marie Scott, Lucy Saunders, and finally, Nicholas Haig. Are any of those folks still around? Yes. Are you Lucy? Yeah. Okay, very good. I just wanted to say that as Wisconsin residents, we're already investors in Foxconn because of the tax incentives that our state has pledged. So as an investor, I would ask that Foxconn tool its, it's as yet to be built factories to be a miracle of efficiency, to recycle, reuse 100% of its water on site and build a factory that contains emissions and uses green infrastructure wisely to help purify air emissions, airborne emissions, in addition to water discharge and sludge from manufacturing processes because airborne emissions are particulate and will become part of the hydrogeological cycle eventually. Um, I do have concerns about observing the letter and the spirit of the Great Lakes Compact. I feel that the application uh, deserves longer than uh, just this time between March uh, 7th and March 21st for public comment. And um, I think that we need to think seriously about creating this as a challenge and an opportunity to convey to Foxconn how much we really treasure our most valuable resource, the, the water of Lake Michigan. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so Nicholas Haid, and it, it, Nicholas is the last speaker that I have uh, other than the people who didn't come up earlier, so uh, please come up and line up behind Nicholas if you didn't get a chance to speak and wish to do so. Hi. 
My name again is Nicholas Hay, I'm a Wisconsin resident. Uh, thank you for holding this meeting tonight. I just want to say that it doesn't seem to me like Christine's request for the diversion is for largely residential purposes. Uh, and I'm concerned that we'll weaken the Great Lakes Compact. So I hope that you do not approve it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, is there anyone else who hasn't had a chance to speak and would like to do so? All right, if not, um, I'd just like to thank you all for attending tonight's hearing. Thank you for your patience. And I'd just like to remind you too that, of course, comments uh, we will accept through March 21st, um, 2018. So thank you for your attendance tonight and the hearing is now closed.